The following podcast is run by a couple of former wheel turners and one pit guy. It's uh, meant for entertainment, not uh, not so much information, but sometimes there's some good information. Um, the opinions expressed are just, these are the morons on the show. Not necessarily right, not necessarily wrong, not uh, the views of any of the sponsors or anything like that. So uh, these guys, they're going to be talking, they might swear here and there, so if that offends you, uh, either uh, grow up or... Uh, Give a little permission for mom and dad. All right, race fans, good to be back. Episode 236. So just off the record, Puka, sorry, buddy, not correct. He made a bold prediction last year that I would, I'd go another four years and not miss. That did not happen. <laughs> I skipped out last week, went on vacation with the family, had a hell of a great time up in Alaska. But episode 236, boys, brought to you by Impact Health Sharing. So it's that time of year, open enrollment right around the corner. If you're self-employed, if you're a business owner, if you got a big family, if you pay for your own health insurance and you're like sick of going to a, a specific doctor, I got way too high deductibles, I'm paying too much monthly, I might have a great solution for you. Um, give me a call, text, Facebook message. Got a product called Impact Health Sharing. I've been able to save people literally thousands of dollars annually. We're talking right around $600, $650 per month for a family. And uh, deductibles are, are super low. So it's worth checking into. I can get you a quote. I can get you the information you need. That's Impact Health Sharing by Ryan Aho. Um, let me know if I can help you. So guys, uh, 235. I heard the show went good. I kind of listened for the record. <laughs> I love Brenda dearly, but we did not elope. So Puka was, again, not not real accurate on that one. I, Coach Crow's talking a little shit as well, um, but I'm back, <laughs> right? Okay, last one with the mic wins. I'm just going to go ahead and point that out. But uh, how was it? Did you guys manage? Nobody died? Uh I, I didn't see anything in you know from the legal team or anything saying that uh, you guys got yourself in trouble while I was in gone because I'll be honest I'm the I'm the cool calm collective one I never start any shit it's 100% usually Bert the Wasota hater that does that I do not <laughs> do that so um, how was it how was the show last week guys uh, it it went well uh, you know how it is when Puka does a show. You have, come on, guys. We got to do this in an hour. We got to get done in an hour. I think we went like an hour and a half. So we did go over uh, Puka's time limit. But uh, he was kind of that way at the USA Nationals, too. We didn't do any after-race podcasts. Because um, on, on Friday, he started out strong. He started the day out strong. But there was day racing and night racing. And... He was too tired to do a podcast at the end of the night. So, well, fuck, he gets up at like four in the morning. I'm pretty sure his bedtime's like 7 p.m. I don't even understand how he even stays up for like a regular night of racing. You got to remember, Puka's kind of an old man. I'm pretty sure he's got to be, I don't know, four or five old years older than us. I'm pretty sure I'm not positive on that. Um, did he get, I got to ask, I mean, a couple of years ago, he took one in the melon. Did all you guys wear helmets? Did you stay away from the rocks? Nobody got hurt this year? Nobody got hurt this year. Just got hit with a few small pebbles, uh, nothing major. Um, the heat was the worst. Well, actually, this was the dirtiest USA Nationals feature I've ever seen. It felt like you, we were getting sandblasted because the wind was blowing in our direction. And you know how that track is after they rework it. And it was like getting sandblasted. And then, you know, it was lightning and three and four and the wind picked up. And that's why we didn't do a podcast Saturday night because because uh, it started raining and we were just trying to get out of there before the bad storms came. Well, you stuck around this time. I know you didn't do that a couple of years ago. You left early, but you didn't stick around. So <laughs> tip of the cap to you. So little weekend recap. Uh, I know Coach Krause, you had a little racing this weekend. How'd the 29 star do at the old ha high flying half mile? Uh, not worth the crap as usual. Uh, no, I uh, I got third and eight and was doing okay. And um, it's kind of one lane around the top. And, you know, I figured how bad of a season I'd have, I'd, I'd You'd think I'd start better than sixth with my point average. Um, but then all of a sudden you look back, I got a second, third to six my last three nights. So it's not horrible. 
Um, and then it started off okay. I was okay. And then I know you texted me and said the car won't turn. Well, I walked in the shop yesterday and I'm like, what in the world? The left rear tire was sticking out about three, four inches farther than it was supposed to. It, it, I bent the pan hard bar mount on the frame. Um, it's a Weir's mount. It's a really nice mount. Um, and it bent over a few inches. So I was wondering why the car got really tight rolling and trying to do some stuff. And then there you have it. So uh, it is what it is. We'll get her back fixed. We're off this week at Viking. We've got our county fairs going on. we got a big demo derby event on on Friday, which is a huge event for us in the Speedway. Um, so I'll sit back, getting ready for that, and I'll run that. And then uh, I'll watch some racing and do some golfing and have some fun. There you go. Well, I talked to Bailey, and Bailey said the 29 Star's been doing a demo derby about every week. So I don't really know. That's nothing new at the Viking Speedway. I don't know what he's talking about because <laughs> uh, um, I had to call security to the tech shed for uh, the 28 Star and someone else on Saturday. So um, I don't know quite what he where he's coming from. So, um, but uh, I saw I no, saw he's, that uh, he he did. Was that him and Sauer? No, it was the two H to Hellerman. I, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he they got into he it on kinda, the front straightaway, and then Hellerman took uh, him out. And I, I, well, like I said, he, I was just, he used up. He did. He used up Hellerman when he got by him. There's no question. He used him up, <laughs> and Hellerman, Hellerman came in the next corner and just flat out dumped him. I'm like, yes, he got him back, right? He kind of pulled an Austin Dillon move there, but yeah, he went to the back, and Hellerman wasn't real happy about that, or. Or was Shane more uh, upset? Who was more upset? Yeah, yeah, it's, from what I've seen, it was Shane. Shane was giving him the bus wheel coming <laughs> off by the tech building. And then they got, then I, like I said, I was, I didn't know what was going on. And usually I run up in the tech shed just to keep things calm and cool myself because I have to. But um, I had just heard a few things up. Uh, it's, Ryan, it's a super sex. It should be the tech shed like that every night, every track, everywhere you go. That's the way the tech shed should be. 100%. Absolutely. Bert. Eastern Wisconsin, uh, you do a little race. You go to the races this weekend. I know you had a busy weekend. Did you make it anywhere this week? Uh, yeah, I went to Shano Speedway on, on Saturday. So uh, I saw the the seven car, seven car late model <laughs> uh, feature there, uh, which was basically like a hot lap session. I don't think anybody passed anybody. Um, seven, seven car feature, Bert, and there was still drama. I'm just saying. I'm just <laughs> I don't know if that was in the heat well, of the feature, but there was definitely drama. Well, there is there is drama. Oh, well, yeah, there was drama in the in the heat race with uh one of the calls that was made against uh Troy Springborn, uh, because two cars tangled in front of him and they called the caution on him. And uh well, he started last in the race anyway, so it didn't cost him too many. It really didn't cost him any positions, but he got involved in a wreck later on and uh broke something with the brakes and he had no brakes. And uh, so he actually just kept rolling slowly and everybody was wondering, well, why doesn't he just pull off the track? Well, he didn't want to pull off the, he said, well, I talked to his son and he said that Troy said he didn't want to just pull off because if there was somebody standing in that area, there would no, be no way for him to stop. So he thought the safest thing would just be to stay on, on the track and coast and get off the track that way. Well, he's got to learn from Larry Lunt. I know, like in Viking Speedway a couple of years ago, you just pull in the piss and you find a hauler you don't like the guy. That'll slow you down. You'll, you'll stop. You just <laughs> find something you don't like. Um, yeah, he got a raw deal there. I mean, fortunately, it was only seven. I guess, fortunately for him, it was only seven cars. But yeah, kind of interesting. They had a what? They had a five grand to win race that night, didn't they? At at Plymouth, they kind of yeah, took it, some of their cars it, away. It was the final race of the 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 super six series at Plymouth. And, uh, it was, that race was supposed to be originally 2,700 to win, but an anonymous sponsor threw in more money to make it 5,000 to win. And, um, Nick Avalink, uh, went there and, uh, took home the $5,000. So, uh, he continues to, uh, to win some of the big money shows. And, uh, the Shano Speedway did have their final race of the, four race too tough to tame I'm say stock car series and uh Trent Nolan was two points back entering the night and he wound up winning the championship by I think 10 points something like that he was leading by four going into the feature that's a little bit of a different series because you get points for your heat races too um so I guess I'm curious what's your opinion on getting points for heat races in a 
in a series like that. Her, uh, Carlos, I'll let you go first. I, we probably share the same thoughts on this, but Carlos, why don't you take that one? Um, well, I mean, here's the deal, Ryan. You raised how many years? Um, them heat races end up being pretty important. Um, in, in this day and age, it, it's, uh, I've done it multiple times. All you got to do is get in a transfer spot these days. You know what I mean? Um, and it's wrong for the fans. Um, they don't want to see that. Um, you got to make these racers race for something. It's the number one reason why I pay thirty dollars to win a heat race. Um, you know, and then you get guys like Dex and Cook to say it's unbelievable that you guys pay thirty dollars to win a heat race. Well, it, it gives you a little something to race for. I mean, thirty bucks is thirty bucks. But, you know, you win, <laughs> you win ten, twelve features throughout the course of summer. It's another three, four hundred bucks. So um, I'm all for it. I, I like that old format. It gave you a little something to race for. Made the draw a little bit more important, obviously, but um, I was always a fan for the heat race points. I'm with you. I got to agree. Um, because going to the racetrack, right, If I, I like points. I like to follow points, whether it's track points, series points, all of them. Well, if there's no points in the heat race and, and they don't have a huge car count, it's like, who gives a shit? I don't even need to watch the heat. It doesn't even matter. It, I like, I like, literally... On regular night racing, I simply do not watch heats because they don't matter, don't care. Literally, they don't mean anything. It's literally a waste of my time. So I'll watch the features. Well, if there's heat race points, that can be the determining factor on the champion because you got to be good. People are like, oh, the races are won on the dry slick. Well, races are won when somebody's versatile, right? If you can be on heat, heat race where it's sticky, choppy, whatever, then get on the dry slick and perform there as well. I personally, as a fan, I, I like it. The flip side as a driver, if I would if I would have uh, had a lot of nights where we did not have heat race points, I would have been probably a lot more pleasant to be around when I drew shitty because I wouldn't have needed to win the heat race. So it probably would have been a lot less stressful because let's face it, heat races, it's kind of tough to pass a lot of times in a heat race. So I see both sides of it, but from the pure entertainment value on the fan side, I like them to have something to race for in the heat race. What's your thought, Bert? Uh, Bert. Uh, well, I, I like having heat race points too, because it makes every race important. It really, it might put a little more emphasis though on luck. Um, because I mean, it, especially in this format, cause it was a draw redraw. So Trent Nolan, who was two points out of first, he drew the front row in his heat race. Um, the guy who was leading the points, I think he started like fifth in his heat race. Um, one of the guys who was three points back started dead last in, heat, in his heat race. He didn't qualify for the feature through the heat races. He had to go through a B just to make it into the feature. Uh, so, um, you know, there's there's some luck involved. But uh, honestly, I, I think the the car that was the driver and car that was the best throughout the entire four race series did win the series, though. And at the end of the day, that's kind of what one's hoping for. So a little recap there from the, the one to go show 83 team. Carl, so you said your stuff was really tight and I, I saw that. Yeah. Dave Dulciak had a pair of wins in a row. Then he went back and he did. Uh, I, I watched him in time trials because they were part of the Mars series. And he literally on the warm up lap, the thing was lock left. He came in the corner, the car went all the way to the fence. He had no brakes all night. So horribly rough night for the one to go show 83 team let's see if them guys can turn it around this week at sycamore so let's get into it boys top five stories of the week brought to you by fast lane motorsports and powder coating of ashland wisconsin proud sponsor of the number one series in all of wasota racing the northland super stock series which of course that came to a conclusion a few weeks back but fast lane they do so much right they they're the parts truck at a lot of different racetracks in the Northland. They they have custom powder coating, sandbla uh, sandblasting, fabricating. They build the Galloper chassis. I mean, they do a ton of different stuff. They help a lot of people, and they can get any part you need. Um, whether you stop in and pick it up, they can drop ship it, mail it to you, whatever you have to do. Chris and the gang at Fastlane Motorsports and Powder Coating, they're going to take good care of you. Check them out. So, guys, number five, and we're going to do this for our – asphalt fans here let's start with a little super stocks on pavement um we'll call that right we'll call that cross holy was it richmond is that where they were at this past weekend yes. holy shit 
So I know there's a lot of dirt fans on here that literally pay no attention, right, to NASCAR. I get it. We're race fans, so we kind of watch a little bit of everything. And quite honestly, I wasn't going to watch it until you guys said, holy shit, you got to check this out. The end of that race um, was unbelievable. So long story short, there's only, what, three weeks left before they go into the chase. Austin Dillon. 32nd in points. Now you're automatically locked into the chase with a win in, in the NASCAR uh, cup, but what is it? The top, how many top in points, Bert go in based on points? He wouldn't have been in based on points. Cause 16. Yeah. 16? Six, yeah, six, yeah. Okay. So half the field. So he was, he's been terrible, right? Well, let's face it. Your sponsors, your team, your owner, everybody in, around you wants you to be in the championship battle period, right? Period. It is what it is. Well, last lap, he may have gotten a little aggressive, possibly, right? Uh, <laughs> he uh, dumps Joey Logano and he dumps Denny Hamlin, both of them on the last lap to win. Those two super pissed off. Everybody's all emotional. The crowd was booing him like crazy. Of course, there was some people cheering because, you know, there's some Childress fans out there and that's kind of how dad drove too. But the fact of the matter is he got aggressive. He got it done. He got in the chase. Your guys' thoughts on Austin Dillon's double mayhem move at Richmond. Well, I, I've been on the record since this show started. Whenever we talk about these last lap passes, I hate the, the bump and run and, you know, the, the, the pushing them out of the way on the last lap to get the lead. I mean, I understand rubbing's racing, but to me, that's really not rough. Well, this really wasn't rubbing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he, he was, he was at least two to three car lengths behind and he just stomped on the gas and well, and then in his interview afterward, he goes, I was just trying to get him loose. Well, yeah, you got him loose. All right. I was just trying to get him loose and then, and get him up the track. Well, you accomplished that. And there's no way he was not going to get loose after getting hit like that. <laughs> oh, he thumped him good. So, so the fact <laughs> of the matter is, let me ask you this. So let's say you're, you're the sponsor of his team, right? And you know there's extra publicity for your team to get into the championship race. Would you rather not make the championship chase at all, or would you rather win like that? <laughs> well, I mean, he he did what he had to do to get into the. I mean, I mean, I think maybe both Logano and Hamlin said it. You know, th that was his only chance to get into the championship chase was. Uh, to do what he did. And, um, if that's your goal, yeah, I mean, you're okay with it. I mean, I did read a story that the executives from Bass Pro Shop were there watching the race. So, um, you know, they got, a, they got a lot of publicity and, you know, and, you know, and from NASCAR standpoint, I mean, they're looking for viewership and something like this is going to get more people to view it. But I, I just, don't think it's it's teaching young racers the right way to race and that's what uh, logano and hamlin said although kenny i did listen to kenny wallace's youtube thing and he did make a good point that you know people are complaining about what dylan did because he did them to hamlin and logano two of the most notorious drivers for doing the exact same thing um but one thing I don't like is the hypocrisy of NASCAR, um, you know, because they, you know, they, they outlawed um, Ross Chastain's thing that he did at Martinsville for safety concerns, but, but they're okay with a car just, you know, demo, you know, just taking out two cars uh, at the end of, of the race. I mean, you, you know, it could have been a big wreck. Somebody got hurt, but I mean, this has been going on since Earnhardt's been doing it, so I, I don't think it's going to change. Yeah, there's no rules against it. You hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, you can't outlaw the, the Ross Chastain move and let him do this every week. And there's no rules, so you got to take advantage. Kraus, is this something you'd do? Would you do that? If you're, if you're him and you're like, I got to get in the chase, it is what it is. Like, there's only a couple races left. I'm running, I'm running third or a second at the time because I think Hamlin got by. But is that something you'd be like, shit, I'm going to do what I got to do. Was he in the right there? 
Yeah, well, absolutely. He's, it's um, he hasn't won a race in two years. He's nowhere to be found in the chase, and he's sitting here going, like he said, I was the fastest car on the track, and he lost a little track position there. Um, decided I got to take matters into my own hands, and he said, yeah, I tried to bump and run him, but he had to get in the corner that hard, so you knew when he roasted in the corner that hard, he was gonna he was gonna spin out Logano. <laughs> um, and then if you you know. It, the Hamlin thing's the Hamlin thing, but if you watch the in-car camera and the different deal, Hamlin got up on him real quick, and he was still turning down the hill. That was a split-second deal, and I think he finally he realized it, and he's like, yeah, I just got to finish this guy off too. So uh, the Hamlin deal was a – you know, Logano was 100% intentional. Um, the Hamlin deal, if, like I said, it happened really fast. It, Hamlin came flying in there, and – um, I'm sure he, you know, he wasn't looking in his rear view cause he was watching to see where Logano was going and decided I got to punt Hamlin too. So, you know what it is, what it is. It's, Hey, maybe it's the one Bert, there you go. Now you're officially a Wasoda fan, Bert, because if that would have happened at Wasoda, <laughs> he would have not, he would have been thrown to the back. Um, he would have yeah. been last place. Um, yellow would have came out right away and Logano would have got the win and Hamlin would have got second. So completely different ball game there. So there you go, Bert. Bert's now 100% of a uh, Wasoda fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I think NASCAR, like Bert said, this is what they want. Um, I think they want the drivers to police the, this themselves. Um, and uh, that's, it's going to happen. It, I, I'm t- telling you right now, if in the next few races or they get into the chase, something's going down with Austin oh. Dillon, he ain't going to make it past the round of 16. So, um, it, <laughs> uh, something they want the drivers to police things themselves. I think that's what they want. And like you said, it's, I haven't watched, I kind of pay attention a little bit and I was actually out on the golf course and my sister from Florida texts me and she goes, did you see the end of the NASCAR race? I'm like, no. And so then that's when I watched it and I sent the text to you guys. None of you guys were watching it either. So uh, just, just uh, at the end of the day, it's some good, clean family fun, Bert. At the end of the day, Austin <laughs> Dillon in the chase. It is what it is, like it or not. All right, number four, speaking of NASCAR guys, but we're going to make the shift to dirt, young money Kyle Larson. So let's face it, he had a lot on his plate to begin the year, right? He was testing for the Indy 500, started, you know, he's heavily involved with the high limit series and all they have going on. And I don't know how to say it, but I mean, he was not all that good on the dirt for the better part of the first half of the season. He had a few nights. But you think back a couple of years ago, Kyle Larson dominated, right? And the beginning, first half of this year, it's like, yeah, he's kind of there, but he wasn't great. Well, how about this? Back-to-back Knoxville Nationals. And was it back-to-back Ironmans as well for Kyle Larson? I think he won that two years in a row, too. Didn't he have that race with Shuhart last year? So heating up, Kyle Larson, your guys' thoughts on the Knoxville Nationals this past week for the sprint cars? Uh, I thought it was pretty good racing. Uh, I I guess I was probably more interested in it because we did our little draft thing. And so I was paying attention as to how my drivers were doing. Um, but I found it interesting that um, during the main feature, you know, everybody was changing tires and Kyle Larson did not change tires uh, on his sprint car. And um, they asked him about it afterwards. And he said, well, Sometimes if you change tires, you don't, you know, you mess up with the handling of the car. You know, you can be running great on your original set, um, but then you change it, change the tires, and you, you don't run as good. And I don't know if that's what happened to Macedo, but Macedo was, he was gaining on Larson in the first half of the race. And then in the, in the, after that, uh, after the, the stop midway through the race, he fell back a few spots and he wasn't uh, in contention anymore so i found that interesting and then the announcers even made the comment then well if you don't if if he doesn't need to change tires do we really need a a mid-race break (laughs) they probably need it for fuel right i I, because then they go 50 laps on a big half mile so i they definitely need it for fuel but that's interesting um rumor has it i'm not sure i didn't i didn't see this but rumor has it they didn't change tires but they were rolling on daytona one on the rear tires on that break is I, I don't know if you guys saw that, you know, getting some tire treatment in there. Kind of interesting. You would think for sure that he'd be at a disadvantage, not changing tires. I mean, I would think, but he clearly wasn't. Um, Coach Krause winning our little uh, 
little mini draft there that we had. So I have a win. You have a win. Bert, incidentally, does not have a win. Hey, um, I, I was on the podium <laughs> this time. <laughs> you were. You were. You were. I was not. I, I had a terrible, a terrible set of picks. So, Coach, uh, what stuck out to you from Knoxville? Uh, yeah, um, you know, that tire thing was definitely uh, interesting. But, you know, starting on the pole, he was able to run a harder compound, and I think, to start. Um, a lot of those guys in the back, they took them tires off that started in the back. They were roasted off. Uh, they put the soft tires on for 25 laps, try to gain a bunch of positions. Um, and like Bird said, all of a sudden you're going to throw a different set of tires on there, harder your car setup's probably going to be off a little bit too. So, you know what? Hey, it is what it is. They did – you know, and he was running the cushion the first 25 laps, Larson was. Um, and it was a cushion. I don't know if you saw him riding around on the high side uh, after the break. It was choppy. It was rough up there. Uh, he barely burned that right rear off at all. But as soon as that green came out in the second 25, he went right to the bottom um, and was running the bottom. So, um, it's you know, the Knoxville Nationals, to me, the it's exciting from Wednesday to Saturday because of the format. The format allows fans – to be, oh, who's in, who's in the, you know, right after, right after Thursday's deal, everybody's on their phones. Who's the top 16 locked in, you know, who's going to be, you know, who's going into Friday. Oh, Donnie Schatz is his first ever Friday night. Uh, Donnie Schatz is racing on a Friday night. Um, so the format there is unbelievable that it's a, it's a spectacle. Um, great place. Obviously it's, you know, it's the biggest dirt race probably in the whole world, to be honest. Um, but the format really, really makes it exciting. Um, obviously, um, Donnie shots made it go viral, um, even more than it, than it did. Um, <laughs> cause, uh, yes, we know you're not the governor of Minnesota, Donnie. We know that. And thank you for that comment, by the way. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, from us outstate Minnesotans, right, Ryan? Right. Right. So, uh, uh, that was, you know, that was cool. And, um, uh, you know, the 50 lap race was just kind of okay. Um, you know, shots really, it's a couple of those guys moved up six, eight spots, shots and shoe heart, some of those guys, but it was pretty much a Kyle Larson show all weekend long. And, uh, he put on a show and when he puts his game face on and he's got that 57 rock and it's, it's basically get out of the way boys. Cause the rest of you are racing for second. Well, yeah, gravel and, and shots weren't very good, by the way, they had rough, rough weekends. And speaking of shots, did you see that save that he made in the feature on, was it Wednesday night? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, he was turned completely yeah. sideways. He, I mean, he's a hell of a wheel, man. Just wasn't his, wasn't his week, but that's a bucket list race. I've never been there. I've been to a lot of, a lot of races all over the country. I've been to Knoxville, you know, Carl, we talked about that. We've been to the late model nationals over there. Never been to the Knoxville, the real Knoxville Nationals. Nothing against the late model people, but the Knoxville Nationals is sprint car racing. And just the way that town, that the whole thing is embraced, that's one that we have to get to, to, to just feel the whole experience of being there. So that is definitely one to put on the list. So hats off to Kyle Larson for his second straight Knoxville Nationals. Number three. The most probably one of the most decorated Midwest mod drivers in our era, um, Jason Vandykamp, with his second five figure payday of 2024, Bert in a B mod in a Midwest mod, right? We're talking five figure pay now, not really five figure payday. The first one it was in Canada, so that's more like six grand, <laughs> right? Because they're their monopoly money doesn't quite equate to the American dollar, but 10,000 Canadian up there. He got that one and uh 10,444 American money at the Tanner by home Memorial Saturday night. Um, I gotta be honest. Joey Jensen got by him. He got by him. He took the lead. Yellow comes out that cost him Ryan Savoy. I don't know if you, you watched that. Didn't you Krause? I did not. I did not watch you one single lap. People, from, I'm telling you. I did not watch one single <laughs> lap of everything. I watched uh highlight of Sabraski, I think, in the late model. But other than that, I didn't watch one single lap of that deal. All right. Well, I'll, I'll kind of recap this. So, Vandy was good, right? Joey Jensen gets by him. Yellow comes out. And he got put back. And I'm like, God, it felt like they went more than a lap. But I guess I don't know. Maybe a lot of times it feels like that. I didn't really go back and count. And Vandy got the lead. Well, on the restart, Ryan Savoy from Superior was good. He actually got inside of him for the lead, and 
kind of overshot the bottom. He wasn't able to hold it down on the bottom and he slid up and, and he actually fell back in and getting fifth. But uh, Vandy Camp, extremely good. I mean, so incredibly smooth. There's another guy. I mean, if you're thinking, we think Shane Sabraski all the time. Jason Vandy Camp is one of the most smooth drivers that I've seen in a Midwest mod. And uh, he got it done um, on when the big money was on the line. He got it done. So congratulations to him on his second big payday of the 2024 season. All right. Let's go to number two two here that was number three number two let's go dirt late model racing is it pretty much i mean is there any question who the most dominant late model driver of 2024 is is there any question at all my illinois crew right the one to go show 83 camp they freaking hate bobby pierce can't stand them <laughs> nobody likes a winner it just is what it is you can play, you can drink your haterade all you want, but he all he does is kick the living shit out of everybody, and that's what he does. He unloads, it's a race for a second, period. So he won his second straight north-south 100 this weekend, and I got a few other things that he's done, but he, uh, I mean, absolutely dominant at, at Florence. Um, he got second the first night in the prelim. He won the second night, and, uh, I mean, he was clearly the class of the field the third night. But what else stuck out to you at the North-South 100? And what else is sticking out to you with what's going on with Bobby Pierce's 2024 campaign? Uh, well, it seems like every year there's, or at least for the last several years, there's one driver that just completely dominates the, the dirt late model scene. Um, I mean... Several years ago, it was uh, Brandon Overton, and then it was Jonathan Davenport when he won the $2 million that year. Um, last year, RTJ, and now this year, it's it's Rick, er, Ricky Pierce. <laughs> Bobby Pierce. <laughs> Bobby Pierce. Ricky I mean, Bobby. You can go Ricky Bobby. You know, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> you know, those drivers, you know, in their respective years, whenever they unloaded, they were expected to win and they were on the minds of every driver who, who was racing against them at that race. And, you know, he's just putting together a magical season. And, uh, I mean, if he, if he wouldn't have, uh, been penalized by world of outlaws, I mean, he'd be dominating that series right now. It may be, well, you know, it, it would have been over by now, probably. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, World of Outlaws, for that because at least gives us maybe a title uh, race going into the to the World Finals at Charlotte because he's coming. He's coming. I mean, they got four big nights of racing this weekend. Um, anything else to go to in Florence besides the pure dominance of Bobby Pierce? Well, I mean, speaking of Bobby Pierce, uh, the first night he didn't make he he didn't make some friends that night. Uh, <laughs> um, the 12 car, who was the 12 car? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, Jason but, uh, Jameson. but, uh, yeah, because he was running on the outside and Pierce drifted up and kind of pushed him in the wall. And then Pierce stopped to, uh, okay. <laughs> Pierce uh, stopped and to talk to, to talk to officials about uh, probably to see if any sheet metal needed to be pulled out. And then Jameson pulled down and kind of swerved at him. And uh, I don't know, did he make contact with, with Pierce's car? Okay. And uh, yeah, so he got, he got the boot <laughs> for that. And then there, and then uh, was it with McCready? I don't know. He stuffed it between two cars entering turn one. I can't remember who it was with, but uh, in his post-race interview, he admitted, you know, I, you know, that you know that one was probably his fault not not the not the one where uh jameson was on the outside but the one entering one pierce said that was probably his fault but uh when when everything's going your way you know you know just keep doing what you're doing and as far as other things about it, one thing i found interesting i'd like to get your opinions about it um now if josh rice is one of the best regional racers in that area. He's beat the 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 travelers at that racetrack. Uh, I don't know if this was the first night in a Longhorn, but it was one of the first nights. With one of the biggest race weekends coming up into your area, would you switch chassis <laughs> on that night? 
I wouldn't because he's been so good there, but he's he's been struggling, right? He has not been the Josh Rice he was a couple of years back. And I mean, psychologically for him, he's he's probably thinking, I know what I have going on right now is not going to get it done. So what do I have to lose? I'm going to try something different because he felt like he was maybe at a disadvantage already. So I don't know. That's a tough call. I mean, there's so much that goes, goes into your mind with confidence. If what you have isn't working and you're not winning and you're not fast, you're a little off the pace, it's very easy to be like, you know what, I'm going to try something different. So I can see why he did it. Kraus? Yeah, for sure. I um, I got one question. for I, I, I know Davenport won both prelims, correct? Yep. Yes. What does that – does that set anything for points on – for Saturday lineups? That's how they line up the heats, but they invert four, I believe. Yeah, they invert they inverted four. Oh, so he did, started did four. have trouble in his heat? I missed the heats. Yeah, you got he finished, fifth, I think. He finished fifth, uh, I think. Yeah. Gotcha. That's why I see he started 19th. So, you know, something about that deal. I know we were arguing and debating about the split feature deal. Um, you know, as a fan sitting on my couch. More features <laughs> is, is shorter features. You know, they're 25 lap sprints. We don't have to sit and watch a 50 car deal or a 50 lap race. You know, two 25 lap features can be kind of uh, fun. Um, but it just seems for some reason that them split fields get to be a varsity and a JV team sometimes way often than more. And it's like, well, you know, that, that one was, I mean, everybody was stacked in that one. And the next one, I think. I mean, Bert, you could have gone out there and ran a crate model and got top 20 at least, <laughs> you know, wow. so it's, um, it's it just, it's, I don't know about those formats. Like you sit there and debate about it and say, Hey, what's, what's this and what's that. And, you know, and I, I'm, I, I'm tell you one thing I'm with Jonathan Davenport on this deal. You're going to race your butt off, win two features, and then they're going to make you invert and start fourth in a heat. I, th- there's no rhyme or reason why he shouldn't have been on the pole on Saturday for a heat race that that's 100% BS. And he should be complaining about that with that invert deal. That's just wrong. Um, so like I said, you, you win two features back to back against that field, you should be on the pole. You've earned it. So you've earned the right to start there. So, um, you know, other than that, I just, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a peer show. Moran was kind of there, you know, you know, Davenport, you know, came from deep, but you know, Great run by Drake Troutman, uh, plus 20, uh, moving up some spots. Um, Max Blair was good, but, you know, RTJ, Dalton Wilson, Tim McCready, um, you know, Brandon Overton, those guys were just kind of okay, you know. Um, They were just kind of there. They really weren't, you know, RTJ I know was a little bit quick, but come feature time you want to see those guys up front, you know. Marlar, there's there's just no one right now. we got a one and I think a bunch of guys trying to fight for a two spot behind Bobby Pierce right now. So I'm um, overall I thought the track was pretty good. It's good race. And there were some slide jobs. Um, I, you know, I don't know what went down to Josh race, Longhorn rocket, stuff like that. But um, when you're in a rocket, especially at that place and you're always fast, I would think he'd stay in that car. So, um, but overall I, you know, it's just right now it's Bobby Pierce shows up and unloads, you know, he's more than likely going to win. Unless he blows a motor. Cause there's been like four of those, <laughs> right? So if he can keep, if he can keep it running, he's definitely going to be the guy. And I mean, you just look back over the last little bit here, 75 grand to win at the North South. He won the USA nationals, the Prairie dirt classic, the go for 50. He won 50 grand at Ogilvy. He got second first, first and second at Houston. Moran got him at that one. But I mean, it's been an unbelievable, unbelievable year for the 32. All right, number one. All right, I, I have Go ahead, Bert. One more comment. Well, Coach yep. brought up uh, varsity versus JV, and uh, that's one thing I, I was thinking about when the features were, were running. I don't know if it was Thursday or Wednesday. I don't know if it was the first night or second night of the split features, but there was just caution after caution after caution after caution. And when you don't have the split features, I mean, I'm not taking anything away from any of the drivers, but you know, when you don't split them up, I mean, you have the best of the best in 
in the final feature. And uh, so you don't necessarily have all the cautions that um, that seem to occur um, this this past weekend. Well, I, I kind of put that towards weekly racing, right? You look at a lot of these races that have 16 cars, 15 cars. Seems like, my God, there's yellows and all these features, right? Well, then all of a sudden you get to a special and there's 40 cars or 50 cars. And most of the people that are spinning out cars in the yellows don't make the show. Not that there can't be yellows, but yeah, you're exactly right. When the top guys are in the big A main, there's definitely less cautions than the split deal. And I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. That's why I don't like 872 provisionals either, because that <laughs> usually ends up being more cautions because the ones getting all the provisionals are the ones causing it, right? Because that's why they're getting provisionals. So, yeah, you're, you're spot on, Bert. All right. Number one, truly the Iron Man. Holy shit, Shane Sabrasky. That's all I can say, right? So, a couple weeks back, um, has a heart attack. Has a heart attack, right? Has to have a stint put in. I believe he had a stint put in, I, I think is what I read. Um, so he has a heart attack and he basically took that. I think he took that weekend off. He took, didn't he take that weekend before he took that weekend off? And there was some question, is he going to run that XR Northern Storm Week? And it's Shane Sabrasky. And he was kind of waiting on doctor approval. I'm not sure if he officially got it or not, but literally one week removed, he decided, you know what? I'm racing. I'm racing the challenge series. That's what I'm doing. And he shows up and he ran. Well, literally a day or two before that, his dad had a stroke also. So not only does he have a heart attack, his dad has a stroke. So, I mean, the family's going, holy shit, right? I mean, enough, right? Right. So he gets in the car and the first night out kind of looked, I wasn't great. The first night out at Ogilvy and kind of thinking in my mind, it's like, well, is in his head a little bit? Is he... You know, is it a psychological deal? Well, well, that proved to be false because when the big money was on the line, he put on a clinic. 15,444 to win for his second straight modified A-Main win at the Tanner Byhome Memorial at the ABC Raceway. And he also, by the way, 20,444 to win in the late model on the finale of the Challenge Series, uh, the week, the swing there. Guys, that is literally $35,888 in two races. Add on top of that, the Tom Wazaleski Memorial for 11111 to win. He won ten grand at the border battle. That's like $57,000 in four races. That is outstanding. That is unbelievable. I'm a little jealous, going to be honest. Um, I am a fan. The 7A, I mean, you're not going to meet a much better family. I mean people that win that much are usually kind of dickheads and he's probably the most humble guy I know, but unbelievable. How, how incredible is it to win those two races on the same night and then add in the fact that that was literally a week removed from having a heart attack. Is that crazy or what? Uh, well, I mean, it's definitely, uh, he's definitely strong willed. And, um, you know, and then, you know, throwing the fact that you said his dad had had a stroke, um, I mean, he, uh, you know, he apparently he can definitely block out when he's racing, he can block out the outside world and just just focus on racing. And I mean, he he's one of the best, if not the best. And I he does have the right colors already. I think he should put a, a Superman logo on his car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I tell you what, he's been unbelievable. So congratulations, Shane Sabrasky. So a little recap. So, Kraus, did you watch any of the XR Northern Storm throughout the whole week, or did you just miss Ashland? Or I, I watched every single race except for the Ashland deal. I just missed Ashland. Okay. So a little recap from the week. So they, so XR, they put on this deal. It was kind of like a mini speed weeks or whatever. So night number one was Monday night. That was at Princeton. Night number two, and that rained out. They went to Ogilvy on Tuesday, Wednesday at Hibbing rained out. Then they went to Proctor, gone to Claw Speedway and Superior, and then they capped it all off in Ashland. Okay. So the way the format worked is they accumulated points over the whole week. Okay. Based on how you did. And then the top eight in overall points from begin from the whole week were locked in to Saturday night's A-Main. So they went to a dash, okay? They lined up straight up 
They went to a dash, not like Florence where they're inverting and doing all that straight up based on points. Then they ran three heats for each of the classes, Midwest mods, mods, and lates. And they took the top, the next six, so that was nine to 14 in points. And that was the front row of each of those three heat races. Okay. Now, how do you suppose they lined up the rest of the heat races? Bert, um, what would you assume? Say that again. How did they do it? The top eight were locked into the feature. Yeah. The yeah, next the six, yep, the next six were the front row of the each of the three heat races. So they had heats and they had a heats B main and all that. So the next six, so ninth was inside pole heat one, yep. right? And so on. And then how do you suppose they lined up second row back? How would you assume? By points. No, they, they did not. They literally <laughs> they literally drew from second back. So the, the next six were locked into the front row, and then they drew. So I talked to some drivers, and they're like, I was like 15th, 16th in points. I literally miss it by one spot. Now I got to freaking draw. I support it all week long. Now I got to draw and start freaking last in a heat race. And guys that come in that hadn't been here all freaking week to start second row because they were luckier on the draw. That's kind of... I don't know. That's kind of questionable yeah. at best. I mean, I get why they did it because in their mind, they're like, well, maybe, maybe we can draw a few extra people in on Saturday, right? Like Demo showed up Saturday because they didn't, you know, why not come Saturday? We can start second row, still have a decent spot in the feature. There's zero chance they would have come if they were starting last in the heat. But boy, that kind of, you know, when I, I got a few messages on that and I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, that really sucks. If you were the 15th, 16th place driver, you kind of got fucked on that deal. It just is what it is. So they, they redrew is what they ended up doing. Well, the winners, the respective winners, the late models, Tyler Peterson started out red hot. He won the first two nights. He won Princeton and, or he won Ogilvy, excuse me. And he won at Proctor. Cole Searing won at the Gonda Claw Speedway. And then of course, Shane Sabraski won the big money. Now, a little bit of a recap on the big money. Kevin Burdick came from deep. He had kind of a little bit of a rough week. He came from deep. He almost won that. He got in. He got inside a second right there with Shane. He got to lap traffic, zigged when he should have zagged. Sabraski made all the right moves in lap traffic. Burdick ended up running over the berm on the bottom, fell back to fourth at the end. But boy, she was racy. It was a good race. Um, another another good run. Probably the best performance of the week. Ashley Anderson, 19th to second at uh, the Gondek Law Speedway Friday. He was coming. I'm here to tell you, if there's a yellow late, hey, congrats, Cole Searing. He was not going to win that race. Now, he might have been in conserve mode with lap traffic and, you know, whatever. But Ashley Anderson was absolutely a rocket ship at the end of that race. And Gondek coming from that deep. So that was a hell of a run. Modifieds, Clayton Wagman. This one here. Probably the best, maybe one of, if not one of, definitely maybe the best feature. Um, Ryan Gerke come from pretty deep and or from a little ways back. He gets the lead and gets into lap traffic and uh, lap cars can't really hold a line. And that's why they're lap cars. And Clayton Wegeman goes scotching by him on the last lap for a last lap pass to win at the big O. Bob Broking got it done with a nice run at the Proctor Speedway. His first win of the year. That was a big one. Brandon Kopp with a late race pass to get by Dave Kane. He won in Superior. He had a good week as well. And then, of course, Shane Sabraski getting it done um, at Ashland. Midwest Mods, here's another great finish. Jason Vanniekamp was gone straight away. I mean, it looked, I mean, Carlos, did you think that race was over? Like, literally over? Yeah, was, absolutely. And here comes David Swearingen, who is really good at Ogilvy, tracks him down. And pa was it a last lap or two to go? It was like, I think it was a last lap pass to, to take the win away right at the end. So Swearingen, a hell of a run. Probably that was another really good finish. And night number two, Joey Jensen, he got it done. Devin Van House, a guy that doesn't, he's kind of a limited schedule. He got it done up in Superior, pretty dominating performance. And Jason Vanniekamp taking home the big money. The best average finishes over the four night swing, Vanniekamp, his average just over a third, 3.25. He had a second, eighth, a second, and a first. Great week for Vanniekamp up there. 
But Brandon Cop and Zach Benson had superb weeks as well. Their average was 3.5. Um, Benson, a fifth and three thirds. Brandon Cop, a sixth, second, fourth, and second. So solid week for both of those two drivers. And then Shane Sabraski had the best average finish in the lates, a fourth, a pair of seventh, and a first. So um, four drivers there that had really, really good weeks. Hold on a second. My phone is ringing, so they're going to have to wait just a minute. Um, best finishes. We talked about Ogilvy. We talked about um, the mid the Midwest mods and mods at Ogilvy, I should say. Gondic Law feature. Brandon Cobb with a nice pass to win. Ashland, I'm going to tell you right now, probably had the best features. Proctor was pretty good. I thought Proctor did a hell of a job battling the rain, keeping the show going, not giving up, grinding it out. But I don't know, man. I mean, if you didn't get a chance to watch Ashland's features, uh, for, I mean, the heat races, track was narrow, pretty muddy. It's like, oh, boy, here we go. But the feature races at the ABC Raceway in Ashland, that's a tip of the cap. I mean, that is a really, really good program. There was food on the bottom, food on the top to end the night. I mean, when you have that much money on the line, you want to have really good features. And that crew up at the ABC Raceway in Ashland, they were spot on very quick when they went out to farm the track. They were Johnny on the spot. They got it together. They got it done and uh, a great program up there in Ashland. So, Kraus, what else stuck out to you? I touched on a little bit there. Anything else stuck out to you? I do have a fan question in regards to something over there. But what else stuck out to you from the XR Northern Storm from what you saw? You know, not a whole lot. I think I know you're going with this fan question. I was going to touch base on it, but I'll wait for you. Um... You know, I, I, I really like the the attempt to do this um, with the swing with the Monday through the, you know, whatever the Saturday was. Um, it's just super tough with fans these days, Ryan. I mean, I don't think Ogilvy looked real. I didn't think the crowd looked real good a couple other nights. It's just fans. It's not like the old days when the Como Mod Series and the Challenge Series would show to town on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and the place was jam-packed. Um, it just doesn't seem to be the case with fans right now. Um you know, and it, I thought car counts, you know, you, you look at Ashland and I get the, I, I get the, um, the location. Um, but that's, was that the biggest pain late model was sort of late model race ever. And mod. And mod. And you had, did you have 30 and late Midwest models? Mod. All three of them, all three of them to win was the best pay ever for them, for them three classes. It, which, which, which is awesome. Um, but I sitting here as a fan, I want to see more than mid 30 cars at them races. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a, it's a tough deal. Um, it's a cool deal. There's no doubt about it, but, uh, I, I, I sit there looking and say, well, since 30 late models for 20 grand to win and mods were mid thirties and the B mods, I mean, I 94 gets 30 cars a night for $350 to win. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, what, what's at the end of the day, what are we trying to accomplish here and what are we trying to do here? And I think we'll maybe touch base on that here in a little bit, but, uh, you know, it kept me busy. I got to watch some racing and, you know, get to see how things are ran and different formats and how they work, how they don't work. Um, horrible deal on that point deal. Um, lining up your, <laughs> yeah, a, a random draw. I, I would have, oh boy, I, Ryan, I, I couldn't imagine you and me back in the day showing up and they have a couple of heat races and we're supposed <laughs> to start second row in the heat and all of a sudden it's boom, I got a random draw and I draw 99, now I'm starting dead last in the heat and you can't pass on a track? I would have been, yeah, there would have been, it would have been jail time for the both of us. So, um, but no, I, like I said, it, it's fun to watch that. I just wish the car counts were uh, up a little bit more. And you were screwed. If you drew bad in the heat races at Ashland, you were done because there was, it was super narrow. They had, they had the end in mind. They were like, we need to have enough moisture in this to have good features tonight. And if you had a, if you drew bad in the heat race, you were in big trouble because the cushion was about a lane and a half off the bottom. And that, that made it really tough, but the features were good. So before we get into the fan questions, I want to give a shout out here to hard charger, um, performance specialties that's nick hoff out in sydney montana and don't let the fact that he's way out in sydney montana go well he's way away from us 
Um, they're shipping. He's got definitely ways. If you need an engine, <laughs> he can get it to you, right? You can be in Minnesota. You can be Wisconsin. Don't matter where it is. He'll take good care of you. In fact, he's got family right there up in Hibbing. You know, he's married to a gal from there. So he, he travels back and forth one, once in a while. And so he can definitely get stuff to you. But Nick, uh, he's been building engines for over 20 years, does a lot of stuff, gears, you name it, um, has the only dyno out there in the Sydney area, really within a several hundred mile area. So if you need dyno time out, out there, um, give him a call. But he does engines for everything from streets to late models, everything in between. If you're a Wasota crate guy, you need to have that fixed because it's a crate and you will need to have that fixed. He's the guy to get a hold of for that. Um, his number, 406 478 four four three seven i personally have ran his engines won races with them i know him very well been a good friend of mine for a long time so give nick a call if you're looking for something different for 2025 or to close out 2024 um he'll take good care of you so let's start with a couple fan questions here regarding the xr northern storm so the first one here is so why why was the car count so light right and I saw there was drivers right from the Ashland area that raced there weekly that didn't even go. Like they didn't run all week long. They still had a chance to draw a second row, but they didn't go on Saturday. Well, did you guys get a chance to see what the entry fee was in relation to the start pay? And so Bert, just for example, the, the Midwest mods was a hundred and on, if you didn't draw in advance, let's say you were only going to run one night, you didn't pay in advance. You're like, I'm just going to run the one night. Or even if you ran every night, but you didn't like free pay a long time ago, if you just decided late, you know, you were going to run that deal. It was a hundred for the Midwest models. It was a $150 draw fee plus $40 per person to get in a pit. So $190. So I personally have not attended races myself i mean i get it i've seen there's other places that do this but i haven't i don't i don't like races where if you make the feature you should for dang sure at least get back what you pay to get in you had to get all the way up to 13th place in both the midwest mods and the mods to recoup your entry fee that night if it was just you not even a pit guy and the draw fee to get in and I had a lot of people reach out to me and they were super pissed. And I mean, I get it. I mean, they got to try to figure out a way to come up with the money to pay 20,444 to win. But Kraus, I mean, do you think that was a determining factor on why a lot of, I don't, I don't, then no disrespect when I say this, right. But kind of your mid pack, your so-called field filler type drivers. Cause a lot of the top drivers were there. The people that were there, they're like, Hey, we have a shot to win this deal. We're here. But do you think a lot of the lower budget teams that maybe felt like, hey, we can get in the deal, we can get in the feature, probably not going to beat the 7A, right? Probably not going to beat Belfi, Cop, whatever. But do you think a lot of them decided to stay home because they looked at the numbers and they're like, well, holy shit, like I got to get up basically in the top 10 to even like even think about covering my costs. Your thoughts? Yeah, 100%. Uh, the other thing is, Bert, I got a question for you. When do you think... There was a pre-entry for this, Bert. When do you think the first pre-entry uh, deadline was? For a race in August. May? Uh, March 1st. Okay. What? How many car how many drivers in Wasota, Ryan? Cars are done March 1st. Uh, zero. And how <laughs> many drivers have any money? In March 1st, they're taking every penny they have to try to get their shit together to start the season. So they don't have an extra money to send in for that deal. And, and then they had the second cutoff deadline was June 1st. I, I mean, I can a little bit understand that deal, but, you know, a lot of racers these days are week to week, don't know where you're going, um, you know, and then you show up to the gate and $500 entry fee for the late models, Bert. Um, and then you wonder why there was only 30 cars. Well, there was already eight cars locked in. Well, those eight cars locked in are going to be probably the eight fastest late models in all of Osota are starting on the front four rows. So you're going to sit there going, okay, I'm best place. Best I'm getting is ninth, but, but there's going to be another probably five to 10 guys that are really good. That should be in that top eight. You got zero chance to move it up in that deal. Absolutely zero. So 
Um, you know, the 500, I think the mods was, was 300 to show up at the gate. And then what gets me is plus you got to buy your own pit pass. You're going to like, now you have to pay for the driver and the car to get in. Like, 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 come on, give the guy a pit pass. He's going to give you a $500 entry fee. Would you please give the guy a pit pass? I mean, it's not that difficult. Um, at 30, at 30, you're, you're out with barely any money. So, um, that's a tough deal. And I think, I think between that and then the, um, the, the driver's locked in, you're not going to get any travelers just on that Saturday, just because you've already got guys locked into the field. Um, and how many, how many people got money this day and age to run six days in a row? Um, I couldn't do it. There'd be zero chance I could do that. I could, I could maybe get by it if it was in this area. You know, if I was doing a KRA, a Mani, a Madison, a Viking, an I-94, I might be able to do it. Um, tell you what, I'm going to be cashing that check the next day to get to the next track. Ryan, you know all about that. We used to, <laughs> I still do that, and I, we used to do that all the time. So um, from that standpoint, um, it's a super, super tough deal. It's too much money. The entry fee is too big. I get thrown all that money out there, but uh, and then super top-heavy purse too i mean really top heavy purse bert um it was i mean it dropped off in a big hurry like i said 13th to break even it's uh you know we're supposed to be here to help drivers this day and age um you know not having a just saw super stock for sale for forty thousand dollars ryan i don't know if you saw that today um that's completely ridiculous um we're supposed to be here to help drivers save money and help grow the sport and get more cars and people into it and then then we got stuff like this. So, but I, I like the idea. I like the I like the six week deal. You know, doing a hell kind of a hell tour, hell week kind of deal. But um, we got to go back to the drawing board and get some common sense into this thing, and you know, see what we can do to turn that double that car count. Well, what I'd like to see him at least do because hey, hats off. It was a it was a great week of racing. There was a lot of great events. I mean, I can promise Shane Sabraski was super happy they put this deal together. I promise, but come up with some sponsors to at least make the starting money. This, you know, you got to at least get your money back if you make the feature. So I think that would be something to improve on for next year. If, the, cause I'm sure they'll do it again. Um, so I, I would like to see that, you know, generate some sponsorship money to make sure that people at least get their money back. If they make the feature, imagine me and run. I mean, the challenge series is a little different cause that was 500 to get in $40 for a pit pass, but the feature there was a thousand dollars to make the show. So the late model side of it, they did get their money back. The mods and Midwest mods absolutely did not. Now you look at that deal down in, uh, in Arizona, or, or I guess it's New Mexico. And now the wild west shootout, that's the same deal. It's literally from about seventh place back. They pay more to get in than they do to fricking race or then they, then they get paid. So it's, it's not like it's the only place this has happened. It's just at some point drivers are going to look at that and be like, there's no way. If you feel like you have a shot to win, totally different deal. If you're a mid-pack guy, not happening. I talked to talked to Joel Collins. He went down there. He went Saturday, and uh, he was all gung-ho. He was pretty excited to go, and I just about talked him out of it because um, nothing against the race, but he's all loaded up, getting ready to leave, and he's like, man, I got to qualify good tonight because it was a challenge series race. The format's qualifying right he thought it was time trials and by his own admission he didn't look at the website to see how it all worked i'm like yeah joel there's no time trials tonight he's like what do you mean i'm like no top eight are locked in i said uh the next six or the next whatever is going to be the front rows of the heat second back or second row back you'll get to draw best you're going to start in a heat is third best you're going to start in a feature is ninth he draws a hundred out of a hundred and i'm like oh <laughs> shit and uh and he didn't realize, you know, on the way up, he looked at the website. He's like, oh, my God, it's $500 to get in plus a pit pass. He's like, well, fuck it. We're on the way up there now. And uh, he let's just say that he was a little salty when he left. He's like, that probably was not the best financial decision he's ever made. But it is what it is. Another question I have. So this one coming from, from um, hold on. This one's coming from Rick. My bad. This one comes from Rick. In the history of Wissota Racing, have you ever seen any driver, any any class, any driver, 
and maybe it's happened. I have not witnessed it, but have you ever seen any driver on a just a general post race tech, right? Not a teardown, not a protest, but a, a post race tech where the driver has to take their engine apart because the tech guy can't really see what the, you know, maybe see something on the heads. So they made a driver take their engine apart. So Ogilvy, Bert, Kennedy Swan had to take the heads off her engine at Ogilvy on basically the first night of the series. They were super happy the next night rained out. So they had time because the tech guys couldn't quite see what they wanted to see. So they made her take the heads off her engine for post-race tech, which forced them then to drive from Ogilvy over to Tim's automotive to put the engine back together, to get it back together for the next night. Have Krauss, have you ever seen that before? Boy, I don't, uh, been, a, been, a, been around for a long time. Um, I'm almost positive it's never happened at Viking on a normal teardown deal. I mean, we pulled headers off cars on Saturday. Um, but I, I honestly, I really, I don't think so. I, I'm say I really don't think so. You know, I, and, and some people are a little bit more savvy, like, like me or, or you, like if we had our engine have to come apart at the track, all we have to do is get a head gasket, throw you know intake gaskets, throw it back together. It's still a pain in the ass. I mean, you don't want to be taking engines apart at racetracks. I'm sure they had a building they did it in, but yeah, that was Kennedy Swan, and I I know there were some people pretty salty. I got a whole bunch of text messages going, "You see, they're fucking with Kennedy Swan." I'm like, well, in their defense, uh, at least they're teching, right? And they're you know, hey, if they're questioning it, hopefully they cover the cost though. Now, I don't know if they did, right? That would be worth checking into, but I'm here to tell you right now that if they're going to make you take your engine apart because they can't see something, they should 100% cover the cost, the gaskets to put that back together, and they should cover your gas money to and from your engine builder to get it put back together. That would be worth checking into. If somebody knows, maybe punch the buttons down here. Did they get reimbursed? They should have. They should have at, at Viking Speedway. If that ever happened where you, or you did that and all of a sudden the driver's legal, there's no issue. Would you think it's the right thing to do to make sure you cover their costs for putting their engine back together? Yeah, 100%. It was no different. That's what the teardown money is for is basically if you get tore down. Now, if the tech guy's going to do it. Um, you know, I, I, I got no, I got no, nothing wrong with throwing a hundred dollar bill at them, um, you know, and say, Hey, here you go. It's, I mean, getting into expenses going to engine builders a different deal because i got intake gaskets and head gaskets right in stock at my dad's shop and you know darn well as i ryan if that happened to me my motor would be running by midnight that night because that's just the way my dad is. he would probably have it run in the pits actually he that's just the way he does things i i buff the rocker or something he's there working on it after the race so um but some people they don't they're not fortunate enough to have that so i i, I think if it comes to heads stuff like that um, intakes, I think there needs to be a set fee and say, Hey, here's a hundred dollars, at least buy a gasket set. I think that go a long way to racers too. be like, you know, that's pretty cool. I, I know it's not much, but you know, give them a little bone and you know, whether it gets reimbursed by Wasoda, something that's it's a good topic to bring up at the tech committee meeting here at the 100. So, um, definitely would throw something at them. And they might have, I don't know. I did not research. They may have done that. Um, but if they didn't, they certainly should. Speaking of teching, um, obviously a little drama. You guys may have talked about this on the show. You probably talked about the little dream, I'm guessing, on the last row. So Nick Trainer wins the little dream. And post-race tech, engine illegal, disqualified, loses $30,000. So this fan question come in from, well, this one came in, anonymous tech committee member. Okay. So this person asked, he goes, when somebody's illegal like this, when you're who's responsible to make sure you're legal, right? Is it the owner of the car? Is it the driver? Is it the engine builder? Right? Because at the end of it, I talked to Nick. I'm like, well, because I like to I like to hammer on tech guys a little bit. I'm gonna start by saying this. Congratulations to the tech committee at that event. I mean, you're putting thirty thousand dollars on the line. You best be teching. They never did in the past. Not not like this. So I will absolutely everybody involved with that. I think it's great. You got it. That kind of money you have to tech. 
it is what it is. I mean, I hammer on tech guys enough and I was kind of hoping he's going to be like, no, it was kind of a bullshit deal. But he's like, no, he goes, it was illegal. I don't really know how to say it, but it was illegal. Heads were illegal and intake was illegal. He goes, but I didn't know. He goes, you know, I, I don't own the car. I was driving for somebody. He took the word of the engine builder. Engine builder told him, hey, this engine's legal. You know, nothing to worry about here. He goes out wins. Who's responsible for that? I got a take on that, but I want you guys to stop. Bert, you're a non-racer. So, I mean, you're a racing community, but you've never been a driver. On the outside hey, I looking raced one in. Race. You did. You're a go you <laughs> did. You're a go-kart guy. Fair enough. <laughs> on the outside looking in, who's responsible for this? I mean, where does that responsibility lie? Well, I mean, ultimately it's the driver's responsibility. Um because he's the one who's going to get get the suspension or get the fine or he's the one who's going to be punished. Uh so it's ultimately it's his responsibility to no to but obviously he he doesn't do all he doesn't do all the engine work, you know, he doesn't do all that. So he has to trust the people that built the engine or, you know, if he's racing for a car owner, he has to trust that car owner, you know, that that car is legal um, because obviously a driver can't do everything and, and double check everything. So I think ultimately, I don't know if responsible is the right word. Um, ultimately, it's on his shoulders, though, whether the car is legal or illegal. Coach, who's to blame? Who's to blame? Is it um, is it Nick's fault? Car owner's fault? Engine builder's fault? <laughs> all of the above? Who's for for him being disqualified from winning his third big paying little dream? Who's to blame? Well, the, the fans already heard me ramble about this last week, um, so I'm not going to do it again because I've already rambled enough. I thought about it some more, and my opinion is not going to change. So you weren't here, Ryan. We talked about this last week. I want to hear your opinion. Um, and then if we got anything to add, I'll add it to yours. Well, first of all, I'm going to start with, if everything is, you know, like he says, if the engine builder built this motor and it was illegal and, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there that don't know jack shit about anything, let alone engines, right? They, they couldn't look at an engine and tell you if it's legal or not. A lot of drivers, car owners, and so on. So that engine builder is a jackass if that's the case okay but on the flip side of it right because i'll be completely honest i don't freaking trust anybody right i've been down this freaking path before where all of a sudden they said my shit was illegal i'm like i don't know what the hell you that that's bullshit right and you're kind of trusting somebody and it turned out that was a bunch of bullshit deal anyway but the fact of the matter is if you're not sure right if you're not sure i'm telling you right now pretty much every tech guy will come over to your house and look at your shit. Um, I'll just be honest. And, and now he learned the hard way. I talked to Nick. He's like, man, my name's got drugged through the mud. I feel like Nick, don't, don't let that get you down. There's some great race car drivers out there in Wissota that went at a high level to this day that have been kicked out of Wissota multiple times and their name is still great. Okay. So don't worry about that. One thing happened. It is what it is. Move on right but learn from it so it's not it's not crazy knowledge that me and bill Engelstead have never i mean we're not tight by any i don't know I, this might not surprise you but we're not tight we're not we we just never have been i've been that opinionated race car driver that always kind of hated on tech guys and he's that tech guy that's like i'm gonna fucking make sure that i get you you know that's kind of him and we just clashed all the time but i got you know when i switched i ran 040506. I ran a Wasota Super Stock for affordable. I had Wagaman engines in there, had great success. And then the following year, Frank Beffra says, Hey, why don't you go ahead and run my car? And I'm like, I got an affordable in Wagaman. I won three straight national titles. Why would I do that? He's like, I'll pay for everything. I'm like, fucking done. <laughs> right? Great. Let's let's do it. Well, my engine wasn't done, right? So he's like, Well, hey, I got an engine a guy ran last year. I bought it used. He goes, Why don't you start the year with this one? I'm like, I know who that guy is and I'll be completely honest. I think he's a cheating fucker and I really don't think his shit's legal. I said, so what I'm going to do is I'm calling Billy. 
I call Bill Engelstead and Bill's like, yeah, Ryan, I'll come over to your shop. He came over to my shop. We pulled the pan. We looked at everything. He goes, probably wouldn't run that one. Probably wouldn't run that one. He said, uh, sure as shit, that thing was illegal as hell. Now, if I would have just said, hey, you know, he ran it, never had an issue. We'll put it in. We'll start the season. Let's go racing. I get disqualified. That's my name. I'm the one in trouble. I'm the one who looks like a freaking cheater because I could tell everybody and their brother, oh, I didn't know. And they'd be like, yeah, whatever, freaking cheater. You know, well, I, I called up Billy and he came over. So Billy would come over and there's a lot of other tech guys out there that would be more than happy. I promise you to go check your stuff out to make sure it's legit. So drivers, if you're not sure, have them, have them come over and check your stuff and then, you know, right. And that'll give you peace of mind. Um, also my rookie year in the modified, I was, I got a fourth in the Wissota points, second in Como series. I had a guy say, Hey, you can run my super, um, at the Northern nationals guys. I won the heat by a straightaway. I'm like, this thing is a rocket ship. I'm like, Holy shit. Is it fast? Right? Well, we're walking through the pits. And at that time, if you got disqualified in one class, you were lost all your points in every class. Okay. That's since changed. That's no longer a thing. Now it's just one. Well, that's the Shane Sabraski rule. Cause he got the illegal and would have lost his points, would have lost three championships and they only, and I think it's the right way. If you, if you're illegal in a mod that shouldn't impact super stocks, for example. Right. Well, at the time it did Bill Engelstad again, right. I hate on the guy all the time, but man, I appreciate the hell out of this because at, at superior, he come up to me and he's like, I gotta be honest. Uh, that thing looked pretty fast. Are, is that thing legal? I'm like, okay, I don't, I have no idea. He goes, if you're not sure, I probably wouldn't finish up front tonight. Uh, I backpedaled like you wouldn't believe I did not make the tech shed that night. Well, guess what? About three weeks later, another driver drove that car. He made the top three. He got teched and he got a 30 day suspension, thousand dollar fine. Wow. Did I dodge a bullet on that one? Right. So, so ultimately drivers got to take it. Owners got to take it and be like, look, the engine builder did them wrong for sure. If that's the case that they got to take that up with the engine builder. But if you're not sure you best get a hold of your tech guy, have them come over, make sure your shit's legal. That way you have peace of mind and you can go race. So Kraus, is that, I have no idea what you said on the show, but does that kind of line up with, with your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the driver thing deal was, uh, I, you know, I had that deal, you know, Jason tennis used to run my super at the, at the uh, fall classic. And we were, I'm like, no, right. It's legal, Ryan. We knew. So, you know, that, and that, that was the case. He was always a top five, top 10 in national points in his mod. Um, he would have lost all his points there. Since they changed that, um, now you just lose the points in that class, but you still can't race your other cars. You still get a 30-day and a 1,000. You can't race your other cars still. So You you pay the double fine and you can. You can now. But before, they, when they, the first switch was, it was just the super, but you couldn't run your mod. Now you can pay the double fine and race right away. And the, the one thing I brought up, Ryan, about that deal is, it's 100% on these engine builders. Cause if you're a big name guy and you show up to Tzar or wherever it is, and you say, I want an engine and you know, and he knows you're just going to put it in and race. He's going to build that thing illegal. And he's going to say, Oh, look at this guy. He's winning one fifteen out of 20 features. Well, guess what? Half the, half the guys out there are going to do. They're going to go to that engine builder and I want that engine. I, it's happened in the super stocks back in the day. We, we 100% know for a fact who it was and what was going on um, back in the day. You want this engine? Um, well, yeah, well, it's illegal. These guys are running and it's illegal. So it's, these, these engine builders are scrambling for business. Um, they're scrambling um, to get their, get their engine in a big time, big name guy. They're 100% going to put an illegal engine in that deal. And at the end of the day, it falls back on the driver. They're going to say, well, well, you know, guy's going to keep selling engines and he's going to hurt his reputation a little bit too. So that was the one point that I brought up, Ryan, is that these engine builders are doing this on purpose. It's out there. Uh, something, you know, and like I said, uh, we had it. My cousin bought an engine from a guy and had a stage four Brzezinski intake on it. We had no idea. Luckily, my dad, who takes part engines and rebuilds them, noticed it. Um, I gave that intake to Wasoda. I gave it to Billy. Um, they started pulling intakes on supers that year just because they were out there 
Um, so it's, it's, it's out there. Um, there's a lot of guys I guarantee that don't know their stuff's illegal and it is. 100%. So I know you guys talked about this a lot, but just briefly, quickly, what the hell happened with Ricky Weiss at Cedar Lake? Um, I heard a little bit about this, but I, 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 well, here, Krause, Ryan, I know you here's heard the first thing I'm going to say about this deal is, um, because I got some big time information, there's still an ongoing investigation going on with this deal. Um, and from what I've been told and what I've been heard, it's the best not to talk about it because okay. there's stuff going on. Um, Ricky's a friend of ours. I know that there's a whole big deal. There's there's other drivers involved in this deal too. So it's just not that. So there's a big investigation. I mean, there was laptops and cell phones taking, and it's it's a big deal. So um, I think right now, and like I said, I think some stuff's going to come out. And I know, Ryan, you know, and what's been going on. I don't know if Bert does, but we've been kind of keeping things between ourselves. So uh, tough situation, tough deal. Um, it needs to get resolved. Everything I've heard, um, this was not Ricky Weiss's doing or his deal. Um, he had some bad people out there in the world doing some bad things and taking advantage of him. So um, hopefully they can get it resolved and get this taken care of. Well, that's the main thing I wanted to get across. And we'll, you know, that we'll have more info as things progress. But a lot of people were like, I can't believe Ricky Weiss did that. What a dirt ball, this and that and the other. Well, based on a lot of stuff that we've heard over the last little bit is he's the least dirt ball in this whole situation. There's some freaking dirt balls that probably definitely got what had coming. And maybe they, they probably should get a whole lot more from what I understand. All right. The last one I got from is Jeff. So could old ass washed up Ryan Aho outperform coach Jeff Krause if he got into a car right now and they both raced on a given night, could he outperform Krause the way his season is going? Bert, it's all you. Take it away. I'm kind of old. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of old. I tripped the odometer last week, so I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. I, I haven't seen either of you two race. Uh, actually, I should you, watch some. You haven't watched Kraus? No, I, I, I just... As I made that statement, I realized that I could see him race. So I'm going to have to make a point to do that. Um, I don't know. Ryan has a lot of national. He has some national championships behind him. Um, I don't know. But how long have you been out of it, Ryan? A long fucking time. The last time I drove <laughs> a, a Krause car was I had to start in the back on a rubbered up deal at freaking uh, the race of champions and that that I, I was there kind of with the pack, but I I didn't nobody really passed much in the back there. But it, it uh, I was a little rusty. I'm definitely more rusty now. The last time I really raced a season, um, a kind of a somewhat season was 2016. I ran Scott Duvall's car. I ran a modified. Um, and I think since then I've run maybe five six shows total in the last seven years. So. I don't know. I don't know. I kind of I think I probably lost a step. So I don't know. Well, uh, I, I think I think I'd have to go with with uh, Krause just because uh, he's still in the game and uh, he may not be getting the finishes, but he's still in the game. <laughs> all right, all right. Maybe well, maybe someday. Maybe someday. We'll I got find I out. got the officials' results, Bert. Okay, it was 2021. Okay, the race of champions, and hence now we got the Ryan Aho rule with race of champions, and it don't exist anymore. Okay, because we, <laughs> I got in trouble for putting uh, the all-time greatest super stock driver uh, that ever was. That there's no questions about. I'm not just saying that because Ryan's a friend of mine, Bertie is, um, and I put him in my other car, and we got heat. Did we not catch heat about that, Ryan? Like, oh, we did. They didn't like that very like, much at all. No, they should be pumping that up. I mean, and <laughs> if you went through the race of champ, Bert, listen to the. I mean. Dexton Cook won the race of champions that year, and this was this was why Dylan Nelson got second, Trevor Trevor Nelson got third, Nasalki got fourth, Justin Tamman, Scott Lawrence, Austin Niemeyer, Jeff Krause got ace. Okay, Shane Sabraski got tenth, Dustin Nelson, Trevor Sauer, okay, Kevin Burdick got sixteenth, Ryan Aho got seventeenth. Okay. What Dave Moss, Moss got eight. Dave Moss right. got eighteenth. Okay, but Bert, <laughs> there was twenty cars, and that's who was in that field. I mean, this wasn't a slouch. 
the, the crappy part about it, like it says, it's one in the morning and you get a shit racetrack. But that's the field you have, Bert. And it's the reason why everybody's so mad about the race of champions. And we were all starting in the back, Ryan. I drew bad, Burdick drew bad, Moss drew bad, Sabraski drew bad. You couldn't draw because you had to automatically start behind everybody else. Um, and we get a rubbered up racetrack. Um, and I, Bert, I ran side by side with Sabraski for that race for like 15 laps. And I think Shane finally came over and was like, I was done. We're in, there's no sense of running for eighth place. But uh, there's, your, there's your answer, Bert. 2021, I beat Ryan fair and square. He was actually in the car <laughs> I'm racing right now. Okay, so um, there's your answer. I beat him. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, maybe someday we'll have to figure this out. So um, let's jump into the rapid fire recaps a little. Who's hot? Who's not? So. Um, quick shout out here to our friends, Daytona One Performance Lubricants. So Buck, the founder of this company, extremely smart in the lubricants industry, in the Hall of Fame for NASA, specifically for lubricants. In fact, the only person in the NASA Hall of Fame for lubricants. Um, huge proponent of, of creating a great product that helps your products last longer and perform better. Specifically, one of the products, he has some tire treatments. He's got a tire cleaner out there that's a great product. It gets all the release agents, which is basically the waxy substance, gets all that out of the tire. Definitely a good thing. Um, above and beyond that, he has some treatments. If you're on a low budget and you don't want to buy tires every night, he has treatments that you can put on your tires to make them last longer. So uh, a lot of people have ran that with a lot of success. So shout out to Daytona One Performance Lubricants. So Bert, um, over this past weekend, any last things that stuck out to you specifically and who's hot and who's not? Um, well, I, I covered East. Eastern Wisconsin, pretty good earlier in the show. I, I'll have one mention from Eastern Wisconsin. Uh, I sent you the video, Ryan. I don't think I sent it to Coach. Uh, uh, the big hubbub in Eastern Wisconsin, though, this past weekend was uh, um, the on track altercation at Audi Speedway in Seymour in the IMCA modified feature. Um, uh, Connor Walensky was leading the feature and they crossed. They crossed the line. The race wasn't over yet, but um, uh, it was at around where the flag stand was, and Marcus Yari got into his rear quarter, and, I mean, it looked like he just turned him, and uh, Walensky went sliding into the corner, and uh, Jaden Schmidt just piled into him. You know, he had nowhere to go and just piled into him. And uh, so uh, – that was kind of the talk of the thing at the driver's meeting at Shano night. The next night, uh, the race director at Shano said, you know, I heard about what happened last night. Uh, I don't want any of that spilling over onto our track. Uh, we will be quick with the black flag tonight. If any of that spills over onto our track tonight. <laughs> I got to be honest, they fucked up, right? They should have invited them both <laughs> over, paid both of their ways in, and they should have said, you should have seen the shit that happened last night, round two tonight. Fill the grandstands <laughs> because we have no idea what's going to go on with these two tonight. That's what well, they should have done. That's marketing. Well, they they, they couldn't have done that anyway because Connor Walensky wasn't at Shano. I don't know if his uh, car was too badly damaged or – uh, he just didn't want to go race there. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that that was kind of the hubbub. That was kind of the excitement in Eastern Wisconsin um, regarding that. Um, who's hot? I mean, I'll I'll go locally. I'll go Nick Avalink. Um, uh, won another um, race. He won the five thousand at Plymouth. I don't know. He was in the top three or four in the Dirt Kings race Sunday night at Angel Park Speedway. Uh, that race was won by Mike Mullen and, um, obviously on the national scene, I mean, I can go with Bobby Pierce, uh, yeah. um, and, uh, Kyle Larson, I'll, I'll take the low hanging fruit for that. <laughs> How about not? Who do you got on the not hot list? Um, not hot list. Um, I'm going to steal one of yours that you had sent. Um, but, uh. Jesse Glenn's, uh, you know, he didn't go to Cedar. Well, I mean, he was going to go on that Thursday night, but then it got rained out. Uh, he said he had prior commitments Friday, went to race at 141. I don't even know where he finished at 141. It wasn't near the top. 
No, I, I don't think he did finish, actually, if I remember correctly. And um, so it's just amazing. I mean, just a few years ago, you know, he was the top driver in the late model in Wissota late model racing. And, you know, he's just nowhere to be found anymore, which, you know, is it, really too bad because, you know, it, you know, he, he was really good that year. And, um, I, I mean, I think we kind of know when it all started to slide away was with the chassis change. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, I mean, you talk about going from one of the top drivers in the area to like, not good overnight. I mean, hopefully he turns it around. I really enjoyed watching Jesse Glenn's, but yeah, he's been pretty much a non-factor for a couple of years now. Coach Rouse, uh, what stuck out to you over this past week and uh, hot not? Well, I got to bring up the, uh, did you guys see the video of Joey Logano pulling in the pit road after the NASCAR race? Yeah, Did I you did. guys see that today? Um, <clears throat> and then that NASCAR official losing his mind coming over to him. Okay. What in the world was that wife doing, holding her baby, standing in the middle of pit road when the cars were coming in the pits? What was she doing? Do you guys have any idea what she was doing? Okay. Well, you what just is, had I can't. That was that was flabbergasting. And and what the hell is the NASCAR? There's there's 800 NASCAR officials down there. Why isn't somebody going? Uh, you need to stay back here until the cars are all in. I mean, what? I, that made no sense. But, well, and 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 the biggest. I mean, probably one of the biggest, I don't even want to call it moments or whatever it was with what Austin Dillon did. That's the first time in the history of NASCAR somebody's punted two guys, you know, <laughs> one and then another one. You know drivers are coming in the pit hot. You know they're going to be mad. You know they're going to be playing bumper tag down pit road. Get off pit road. And don't get mad at Joey Logano. He just got punted, slammed in the wall. He's going to win the race, got taken out, and then you're going to come over and chew him out? No. It, you know what? It, it, someone was bound to get ran over there. Some, something needs to be happening there because that could have been really, really bad. And then things For would have sure. really got worse. So they, they need to take care of that deal. Get off pit road. I mean, you know, it's like, come on. You, you can't wait another extra two minutes for your husband to get out of the car, standing by and pit wall to go give him a kiss. I mean, come on. Let's, let's use our head, people. Um, <laughs> Bert, I got a something for you. Um, Craig Anderson, okay, the Hornet driver from my buddy from Alexandria. He's coming your way to race, Bert. Um, yeah. He's coming. Is it out of gaming? Is that how you say that? At Seymour, out, out of gaming, yes. And then he's going to run Shano. So he's, okay. he runs the airport here in town. He's got some air show or some kind of show out there. Okay. And he's like. I'm just going to bring my race car. I'm going to go out there and run with the sport compacts. I'm going to go run my race car. So Bert, he's got one to go show stickers on his car. If you're at okay. the track, Craig Anderson, he's number 90. He's going to be a sport compact. You got to go down there and say hello to him. So I'm calling you out, Bert. I don't what? know if it's this weekend or the following weekend, but he's going out there pretty soon. So uh, make sure you uh, make sure you get out there and say hi to him. What number? Number 90. It's blue. 90. Okay. Okay. When I went down to the Viking Speedway and traveled, I'd have people just randomly show up and help me. So I'm just going to go ahead and volunteer Bert. Bert's going to go ahead and pit for him when he's there. <laughs> there we go. We got we got a, we got a pit guy for you, uh, Craig. Uh, I'll make sure the lug nuts are tight. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Who's hot? National scene. There's only two guys. It's Pearson Larson. There's nobody else out there. Ryan, don't even attempt to say anybody. <laughs> running local super late models or something else. There's nobody else out there. Okay. You, you and you're running your little podunk Illinois tracks out there through super late models. You're going <laughs> to come up with somebody hot over there. Nobody cares. Okay. We'll see. The show's we'll about see. ratings. Nobody cares about who's hot other than Kyle Larson and Bobby Pierce. Okay. Um, locally, Ryan, Bert, you got to go with the Brower brothers. I mean, Things are on the line right now. You're getting down there to the national point deal. Um, Colton got a huge win at Viking. He's been on fire since July 18th. I think he's got like five wins. Um, I know he got second in uh, at Montevideo on Friday. Dean Upton, granted, I missed that race. I don't know, remember what happened there. I watched the Supers and the Mods and a couple other the Mod 4s, but I missed the first three features there. And then Braden Brower, he's putting a stamp on that. 
Um, I think, was it two out of three? Maybe three out of three? Um, three out of four? I think he won across the border. DNF Grand Forks and then won two more. So I got to go with the Brower brothers. Um, things are on the line right now. National points. They're sitting one and two. They want to finish one and two. So tip their cap to the Brower brothers right now. They're going to stay hot. It's going to be fun to watch those guys. Who's not? <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> Your buddy Buzzy, like <laughs> I, I, he's he's screwing up my bold prediction here because he, he then he then he lets a South Dakota car pass him in national points this week. He's not the national points leader. It's like, come on, Buzzy, we we, we got to get this thing going. Uh, we got to get some wins under your belt. We we want to see you come to the one hundred and you know run all three nights and be a contender there. So we got to get that going. Um, and then um, who's not hot national scene? Buddy Colfoy, like, where's he been? Disney make the show at Knoxville. I mean, he's a wheel man. He can drive everything. He can drive a wheelbarrow. He can drive everything. He just, and to be, to be honest with you, at the beginning of the year, it was like, oh, boy, he's going to be in contention here and be up there. But I think he's down to, like, seventh or eighth in points now, and um, he's just hasn't been very good as of late. So, like I said, I don't know what he's got going on and what he's thinking about, but um, definitely Buddy Colfoyd on the not hot list. Uh, yeah, you're spot on there. So I'm going to go uh, – so I got a few things here before we jump into my not hot and hot list here. So Midwest Mods, there was a few things that happened over this past weekend, 1,000 to win, win at the Red Cedar Speedway. A guy that doesn't run for national points at all, but this dude is a flat out rocket ship all the time. Nick Kaler. Um, he won a thousand to win. Um, that guy wins close to double digits about every year, the last few years. So um that's the guy that can make some noise come in by time. They had the Mountain States mod tour out west, and uh they actually concluded that this past weekend in Sheridan. And uh the Likers are really team players. They're really team players. I in our pickums, I picked Tony Liker to win both nights, but I also said Troy Liker would win the championship. Um, so Tony Liker did win both nights, and Troy was nice enough to let his brother win, but he took home the championship, so they kind of dominated that deal as they do out west. Um, in the Super Stocks, how about Jordan Hinkemeyer? There's a kid that's been having a hell of a season. He had a pair of wins this past weekend, including a thousand a win at the Fiesta City Speedway over in Montevideo. He's got seven wins on the year. That's got to be the most wins old Jordo has um, in any given year. So he has a really good year going. Another thing that's really rocking right now, that Dirt Race Central Street Stock Tour. Guys, that's getting tight. That is tight. There's only a handful of races left. So they were out in Jamestown this past weekend. Ty Agan. Andrew Hansen, they each won their respective nights, and uh, both of them very, very good all season long, making the trip from Wisconsin, both of them out to North Dakota. But did you see the point battle in that right now, Kraus? No, Ty, I haven't looked. Ty Egan is two points ahead of Andrew Hansen right now, or uh, my uh, my bad, two points ahead of Kyle Dykoff right now. So that is a super close point battle coming down to the wire. That's one you're going to want to keep an eye on. Um, all the races, of course, on Dirt Race Central. Ashley Boyum got her second win of the weekend or second win of the year. Now, she went, she's up north now. She lives up in uh, International Falls or Fort Francis or somewhere up there. She's basically Canadian now. But she beat David Simpson on his home turf at Thunder Bay. She won over at the Thunder City Speedway. They get 40 cars a night. Winning over there is like winning a special everywhere else. So congrats to her. Riley Ament, he's a kid, 15-year-old kid from up in northern Minnesota. First career win, won in the Hornets at Proctor on Sunday. Congratulations to him. Changa and I jinxed. Dustin Strand. Strand has been a freaking missile. I think he had seven straight late model wins. And I was over at Chonga's house uh, Saturday night. Saturday night, yeah. And the races, the Knoxville was done and everything was done. I'm like, you know what? The feature's still going on at Jamestown. They had like 160 cars. Let's throw that on. He's like, holy fuck, I am tired. Incidentally, guys, he tried to kill himself this past week. Not sure if he knew that. He, you know, he had stairs going into his house and the, his deck is about as high as my head. He got up to the top step and the whole thing collapsed and he landed on top of it. I'm like, don't try to kill yourself, guy. Like we, we need you. Like, what, what are you doing? So glad he's okay. That could have been really ugly. 
But he's like, ah, we ain't going to watch that. I'm like, dude, you got to watch Dustin Strand. He has been an absolute rocket ship. He's kind of getting hosed out of the championship with this extra point nonsense. Talk about that at another time. But Chad Becker spoiled the party. Becker had a couple wins. He traveled away from home. He went to Fergus, started like eighth and one. He started, I think, sixth up at Jamestown, drove by Dustin Strand. So Becker, who's had a pretty quiet season, he parked in Victory Lane. Skorczewski's had, he's been pretty quick out there as well. So that's kind of what I saw this past weekend that stuck out. Who's hot? The Wasota Late Model Challenge Series points. I believe it's five or four point difference between Cole Searing and Tyler Peterson. They got a pretty big lead on Sebraski because he, he got off to a little bit of a slow start, but there's only Labor Day weekend left. They got the silver 1000, both days of the Labor Day shootout, or they got the, the um, Wasota Classic, both days of the Labor Day shootout, and then it ends Wednesday of the Wasota 100. And it's literally within five points right now for the championship. That is going to be must see. You're going to want to, you're not going to want to miss that. Jim Chisholm, hot. He had a, he was down by like 20 some points in the US MTS points. And after this past weekend, over the last two weeks, He's gotten one of you can maybe look it up if you because I'm on my phone. I believe he's got like dang near a 50 point lead or better. Yeah, it, in just, it's around it's around 50 points. I, yeah, I looked I mean, right so before the show. He is putting himself in position right now to win that USMTS title. Jake Tim had been super good all year long, but Jim Chisholm's the guy right now. And how do you not put Tyler Peterson on the list? I mean, he won two Challenge Series races this week. He's within striking distance, and here's the deal. He he has a ton of 113s. I think he's at 17 wins. They take your best 20. He's literally a week or two away from locking up his second straight with Soda Late Model National Championship. And Shane Sabraski, when the money's on the line, all he does is win. Not hot, Pat Door. He's been on there all year. He is... I know you guys said, well, he's getting faster. He ran good at Cedar Lake. I he saw ran him good at Nationals. Cedar. He's pretty good. <laughs> he did not run good this weekend. He did have a 30. He got a podium at Superior. Um, other than that, he wasn't in the top 10 the other three nights. I mean, this is not the Pat Door we're used to seeing. He, he's got to be looking at it going, is 2024 over yet? Because he's got a lot of gas left in the tank. That car, not his friend. He should cut it up, sell it for scrap. Um, I'm going to go with Jake Tim. Went from having a commanding lead. It was like 80 points or, or better at one point to be in 50. He still runs good. He's had a few DNFs in there. Kind of had some bad luck along the way. But Jake Tim went from completely in the driver's seat for the US MTS championship to on the outside looking in. David Simpson. David Simpson has the most wins and the most full point shows in the Midwest mods. It looked like he was going to be the guy to beat in the national title run. He's been kind of slipping just a little bit, struggled, didn't even make the show the first two nights at the XR Northern Storm, didn't even show up the next couple nights. He said, screw it, I'm out. He's, he's struggling to find victory lane. Joey Jensen's coming. Simpson needs to focus one race at a time. It's going to be close. And the, the one to go show cars, 29 star, right? The 83 cars. We got to find victory lane here, guys. So, I mean, that's what we got to do. So. With that said, let's jump into the 2024 Pick'ems segment brought to you by our friend Brad Parsons, Brad Parsons Soil and Egg Solutions. So if you're in Western Minnesota, the Dakotas, and you want higher yields, you want to make more money, you got to have the right products in your spray packages. Brad's the guy to call. Call him up 320-219-3542 and learn about all the products he has that are proven. He has the data. We know people personally that are using their products that have had success, that have told us their stories. Give him a call if you want to make more money in the farming industry. So this past week, guys, a couple big movers and shakers. Bert, you had a good week this week. Dano had the best week. Dano was plus 26. You were plus 25. So you guys kind of trying to track me down in that third spot. You're fourth and fifth. Standings right now, Rain Man Curtis, he's still leading 275. Wachonga's there, four points back at 271. I gained on them this weekend. I'm at 259 in third. Then it's Dano and Burt. You guys are right there on the outside looking in. Worker B, 224. 
Man Bun Dan, he's over at 212, one point ahead of the Uper. Coach here at 207, Bromance 182, and Kenny, man, oh, man, Beefcake, 166. Come on, guy, get it together. Like, literally, Beefcake, this next week or whatever, just literally pick all the favorites. Don't try to get creative. You need to get back into this thing. So this week, guys, got a handful of races we're picking. And I'll just quickly name off the races. You name who we have, and then we're going to move on. World of Outlaw Late Models, four nights of action this week. Highland and Spoon River in Illinois. And then they go to Makokata Friday and Saturday for a doubleheader. Bert, who do you got? Hoffman, Bishop, Pierce, Pierce. Hoffman, Bishop, Pierce, Pierce. Coach Kraus. How many races are they doing in a row? Four. Four. Now you got me all doubled up here. I got to find my picks. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. I got him. I had a, since I'm on my phone, we got him going right here. We can find him. Do, to do, to do, 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 to do, to do. Let's see. What did I do? Pierce, Gustin, Pierce, Pierce. You took Pierce three of the four nights. Really? <laughs> Well, I, I took him four out of the four just to be that guy. Next year, that ain't happening, but for this year, it is. Bobby Pierce times four. High limit sprints. Thunder Bowl, Kings, and Placerville. Thursday, Friday, Saturday on Flow Racing. Bert, who do you got? Uh, Larson, Courtney, Courtney. Coach? Rico, sweet, Courtney. Rico, sweet, Courtney. And I went sunshine, Tyler Courtney times three. Topless 100 at Batesville for the Lucas Oil Dirt Late Models Friday and Saturday. Bert. T Mac gets his first win and Superman. I like it. I like it. All right, coach. RTJ sweeping the weekend. Don't even show up. It's over. Um, You said Moran wrong because Devin Moran is going to sweep the weekend. Um, You're sadly mistaken. Devin Moran is smooth, slippery. He's going to get that shit done. That's what he does. World of Outlaw Sprint Cars, Jackson Motorplex, Friday and Saturday, Bert. Macedo, Gravel. Coach? Shots, Gravel. And I went David Sand and Gravel times two. Hunt the Front Late Model Series at Sonoy in the big state of Georgia. Bert? Ashton Winger. Coach? Uh, Brandon Overton. I took Ashton Winger as well. The Howie Schill Memorial Race, NLRA late models, Friday and Saturday, Red River Valley Speedway, West Fargo, North Dakota. Bert? Cole Schill, Dustin Strand. Coach? Uh, TPO, both of them. I took Tyler Peterson and Mike Gresseth on night number two. He runs really good over there as well. Tri-State, actually, we'll go Dirt Kings late models, Mississippi Thunder Speedway Friday night. I think it's five grand to win, isn't it, Bert? I think so. I'm not positive, but it's that's on race and dirt. Bert, who do you got at, at Mississippi Thunder? Jake Tim. Coach? Um, 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 is Anvilink going, Bert? I would imagine. I took Anvilink. I took Jake Tim as well. Tri-State late models out in South Dakota, Miller Central Speedway and the Dakota State Fair Speedway in Huron. Bert. Uh, Snowdrift and Corey Zeitner. Ba-bum. I took uh, I took Cole Searing for both. I took Cole Searing for both as well. Was Soda Boy going to get her done? Cedar Lake Speedway month of money, five large to the Wasota Superstock A main winner Saturday night. Bert. Terrence Spacek. Coach. Dexton Cook. Redemption time. He had five grand stolen from him last year. He's coming back to get it this year. Dexton Cook in 78K. Bob Gerke Memorial Race, I-94, Fergus Falls, Friday night for the Wissota Modifieds, Bert. I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. Dustin Bitson. Dusty Bitson. Yep, he's a, he's got a hot rod. Coach? Good pick, Bert. Good pick. 
The locals are going to be mad at me because I'm going with Dan Ebert. Yeah, that yeah. Ryan Gerke is going to win his father's memorial race. Gerke's had a good hot rod all year. That's going to be a good race. There's going to be some freaking good race cars at that. That'll be worth checking out on Dirt Race Central for sure. So the best format in all of racing, 141 <laughs> Speedway, the the MBD IMCA Sport Mods, Captain of the Creek, $10,000 to win Wednesday night, Bert. Coy Vlees. He's been good all year. Coach? That's who I took. I don't uh, – I watched most of it tonight, too. It looks like double heat races, and then what's tomorrow? Six more heat races, and then – seven more heat races and then a three lap heat race. And then we're just going to line up. Then we're going to redraw for the feature all 26. I don't know how he did, but I picked cam rhymers. That's who I took cam rhymers carp Memorial at Jamestown for the Midwest mods, Bert. Uh, Rodin coach Lucas Rodin. The Nightmare Lucas Rodine, we all picked him on that one. So he's absolutely fucked because he's probably jinxed. Although he got robbed last week, so he's probably pissed because he, he got called for dumping somebody and the guy was dead sideways in front of him and he just clipped him a little bit. So it totally wasn't his fault. Horrible call. So Rodine's going to get redemption there. Mod was sort of modified special Saturday night at Madison, Bert. Nate Heinrich. Coach, I'm going with the team one to go show card. Ryan Flatten, Ryan Flatten, that'd be good. And uh, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Nate Heinrich. Although I, you know, I, I know my buddy Brian Hovind's gonna be a little upset with me, but Heinrich's been pretty darn good over there as well. All right, Hibbing Raceway Saturday night, late models, modifieds, and uh, super stocks. Bert, Ryan Aho times three. That would be no. splendid, but uh, <laughs> nope, nope. Um, Broking, Andrew Inman, and Tristan Labarge. Okay, coach. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on the limb though and say you've won in all three of those classes at Hibbing. I would have to say correct. I have. It's a pretty good accomplishment. That's a good accomplishment. I got uh, Kevin Burdick, Mac Esty in the mods, and Tristan Labarge in the supers. And I am going to go with Johnny Broking in the lates and the mods. He's going to double up for the first time in his career. He's got the mod back together. That will be out this weekend. And I'm going to go with Tristan Labarge, who spent a lot of time in the 71A shop, and he's going to get it done in the super stock. So that's our races this week. Get out to the track if you can. If you can't, jump online and watch on uh, Dirt Race Central or whatever, whatever other streaming platform you watch. All right. Three bold predictions, Coach, brought to you by Elevate-Visual.com Video Productions. Uh, make sure if you need any video work done, drone work done, if you're a real estate agent, anything like that. Uh, he also does um, commercials for your businesses. Um, he can edit videos and do all that good stuff. Um, he was down at Deer Creek last week at the Harris Clash. Um, he, he gets around. He's a racing guy. He does the Soda 100. He does the Boone Super Nationals. I uh, does video production for all that stuff. So get get a hold of Brandon at elevate-visual.com. Uh, he also has a Facebook page. That's how rumors get started. I, I don't know if he appreciates that. He does not get around. All right. He does not get around. He, he goes a lot of places and not, he's not that guy. Okay. He's not that guy. All right. But elevate-visual. Thanks, Brandon, for all you do. All right. We had some stuff come off the board this past week. Bert, you said that Jake Tim, I done this a couple weeks ago. I don't know what race. Well, maybe this was this past weekend. You said Jake Tim was going to have a couple podiums and one win in the USMTS. I think that was down at the Lucas Oil Speedway a couple weeks ago. Yeah. That, yeah, that we, did not happen. We didn't do any bold predictions last week. So okay, okay. Um, Little Dream, you said there was that would pay over thirty grand this year, and it did. I think it was right at thirty, wasn't it? Like right at thirty. Um, and then you said there would be three different winners in the local late models at the USA Nationals. And who won those races this year? Do you remember offhand? I know uh, Sam, did Sammy win one? I don't Sammy know. won. The Edgington won one. And um, the 20, Panitsky or 22 car. Panitsky? Yeah. So P Panitsky, Sam Mars, and uh, 
Edgington. Edgington. And Edgington. Okay, so you got that one right. Good job. All right. Uper had to come off the board. He said Longhorn would sweep the podiums here, and uh, that did not happen. Uh, that was a couple – I think I think that was two weeks ago as well. And he also said at the Ironman at Peevely, a high-limit driver would win that race, and that is correct. Kyle Larson was the winner of that. I had a few come off the board. I said there would be more local late models than World of Outlaw late models at the USA Nationals. That was incorrect. That was wrong. I said Jesse Glenn's would go to 141 and get on the podium. That was <laughs> that was that was bold, but no, that did not happen. I also said that Minnesota Wisconsin drivers would have at least two top 10 finishes in World of Outlaw late model action at the Cedar Lake Speedway. Well, that that did happen. I got credit for that. Was Sorensen top 10 twice? Is that what happened? Where? See, at the USA Nationals? Well, Sorensen got, what, second or third in the big show, right? Yeah. Yeah, he, he got third, I think, in the big show. Um, I don't remember uh, where he's. Our statistician gave me a yes on there. So did Brent Larson have any top 10s? Uh, he did one night. Pot, okay, there I it think, is. I think, it is. I think the day race. The day race. Okay, okay. so there they are right there. Brent Larson and Dustin Sorensen each had one. So I got that correct. And then I said Tony Liker would win 50% or more of the Mountain States Mod Tour races and be the champion. He won 50% or more of the races, but his brother Troy won the championship. Congratulations to them. Can you look this up really? I mean... I guess we can come back to this. I also said there was going to be at least five DQs at the little dream. And I know there was at least three between all the heat races and everything, but that's a lot to look up right now. We'll look at, we'll get back to you on that one. All right, coach, you had a few come off the board. You said there'd be 70 or more cars at the little dream. There was only 59, still a good turnout, but not 70. You said, couple weeks back that between at that Wilmot and Cedar Lake swing that world of all late models, three of four would be won by the same driver. And that was Pierce. So that was correct. You said at Wheatland at the Saturday show at Wheatland for the USMTS, five different chassis builders in the top five. There was Jim Chisholm in a, in a skyrocket, Jake Tim in a rage, Vanderbeek in a Vanderbilt, Strickler in a K. Dillard car, and Ebert in a Mullins. So more parody right there in the USMTS. And Beefcake had a couple. He said the Little Dream would have a repeat winner. A way to fucking go, right? Absolutely <laughs> jink, and, uh, jinx and Nick Trainer. And it would pay five grand more. It did not pay five grand more. It paid more, but not five grand more. And he jinxed Nick Trainer. Um, because who won that? Cody Coomer, right? Cody Coomer won that? Yes. And four different podiums, and the winner would double up at the Ironman, and that did happen. Kyle Larson won both, and there was four different podium drivers. So we keep track of the amount of correct predictions we make and the percentage correct of the ones that come off the board. The Uper is kicking our ass, guys. Uh, he's got He's got 22 correct predictions. Peanut Gallery at 16. Bert, you and Coach at 15, I'm at 13. So I'm gaining on you guys, but got a lot of work to do to catch a Uper. He's at 31.4 on predictions. Kraus, what do you got? Five, you had five DQs at Rice Lake. Oh, so I got that one right. So I'll get another one there. So I'm at 14 um, once uh, once Jeff puts that on there. So, so Jeff, right there, one more, five DQs. I got that right at the Little Dream. So tally that up there, big boy. All right. So we're going to make three bold predictions to close out the show. Racing related. We'll make uh, three laps around the track here. We'll go Bert, Coach. Then I got Youpers and Beefcakes, and I got my own. So, Bert, your first prediction. T-Mac is going to park it in victory lane at least one night this weekend. There you go. Doubling up on that. Uh, doubling up right there. All right, Coach. Um, I'm going to go with my favorite series, the high limits, um, <laughs> and go, um, three for three, three different winners this week at the high limit series, three different winners at the high limits. All right. 
So Beefcake, his first one, topless 100 at the Lucas Oil Speedway, or not Lucas Oil Speedway, but at, at Batesville for the Lucas Oil Dirt Late Models. One of the nights will be a first-time topless slash first-time Lucas Oil. So it's going to be a first-time winner for the event, but one of the winners will be a first-time winner in the Lucas Oil Dirt Late Model Series. Well, that's pretty bold. Probably too bold because I don't think that's going to happen. But, hey, if it does, you're going to give them big kudos. All right, Uper, his first one. All right, they're swinging for the fences, boys. They're swinging for the fences. That one was bold. This one is bolder. Uper says Bobby Pierce will go winless in World of Outlaw late model action this week. Pretty sure he's on the cannabis. I'm not sure what's <laughs> going on there. Okay. All right. My first prediction, David Simpson struggling just a little bit. Joey Jensen, a little bit quicker right now. Simpson leading with Soda Midwest Mod National Points, has the most wins, has the most keep the 113s. Joey Jensen is going to track down and pass David Simpson and win the Wissota Midwest Mod National title. Coach is disagreeing. So Coach's next bold prediction is I'm wrong on that. All right, Bert, your next one. Um, Hopefully I don't jinx him on this, but I'm going to go 17-year-old uh, Coy Vlees will win the captain at the creek at 141 Speedway. I almost picked him. He's got a bunch of wins this year. Sounds like is he leading? I think he's leading points there too, ain't he? I'm not sure if he is or not. Yeah, he's leading okay. the points there. That's why I picked him, Bert. Okay. Yep. Yep. There you go. All right, coach. Uh it's going to be 50 with Soda Superstock at Cedar Lake on Saturday night. 50 or more. 50 or more. 50 or more, was so, that would be great. That would be great. I hope you're right. All right. Uper's second prediction. The Ironman Shane Sabraski will win 50% or more of his features this week. 50% or more of the features Shane Sabraski attends will be won by the 7A this week. Beefcake is going to go to the Cedar Lake Speedway Month of Money 5K to win Superstock A-Main as well. Three, these three drivers in no particular order will be on the podium. Dexton Cook, Jesse Radetzky, and Mike Loomis. Those three drivers will be the podium drivers. And my second prediction is there's going to be some stout cars over at I-94 for the Bob Gurkey Memorial. These two drivers will both have podium finishes. Ryan Gerke, Brady Gertis will both finish on the podium at I-94 this week. All right, Bert. All right. I didn't pick him for any races, so I'm going to go in late model action. TPO will get shut out of wins this weekend. Okay. Okay. Off the road. Being that you guys already sent in your picks and coach picked them both nights. Word on the street, he's not racing Saturday. I think he has a wedding. So <laughs> Kraus is like, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coach, what do you got? <laughs> well, rule number one, when you're a race car driver and there's someone gets married Friday, Saturday, like I just missed a wedding this last, I'm supposed to be at one. Yeah, no, that, that don't happen. <laughs> you want me at your wedding? Don't get married during hockey season. Don't get married during racing season, right? Well, that it, that's how things work. That's what MJ McBride always said. If you want me at your wedding, don't get married during race season. Huh. Yeah, hockey it's... hockey season and racing season. That's like fifty out of the fifty-two weeks of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, great for me. <laughs> We're gonna go um, a little against my picks, but. Uh, it is what it is. I'm going to go um, World All LA Models. It's going to be uh, three three out of the four nights. We're going to have different winners. There's a rain out, two out of three. But I really want to see four. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to, I want to see some parody World Outlaws. And uh, another little tidbit I was going to throw out there. I'm starting to like uh, 
not that I don't, I always been, but I'm more of a World All LA model fan than I am Lucas Oil right now. I think the competition's better. I think the car counts are better. I think it's a deeper field. I think it's better racing. Um, I, I, I really like what the World All World of All LA models got going on right now. Yeah, we'll see what happens this weekend because they're back to split again, right? So we'll see if that rings true this week. All right, we're gonna go to Uper's third and final prediction. And guys, I might do a thing. Probably should have touched on this earlier in the show. So yeah, I'm getting the old guy award at Hibbing this this Saturday. I, I get inducted into the Hall of Fame with uh with Kelly Esty, with Jay Kittner, Lenny Pastelli. So pretty excited about that. Pretty big honor. Hibbing's been my home track. Excited. Remember last year I got inducted into Superior? My old pit guy says, You need to run my car. And I made like a lap and a half and blew an engine. Well, between him and my daughter, I'm not sure which one's blowing up my phone more about I need to run his car at Hibbing. So what do you think? Should I run his car at my home track in Hibbing on Hall of Fame night? He should have won the line that I was there in Hibbing. He's got TRC. He's got a Ford concept that he builds. Perfect performance, by the way. Um, what do you think? Uh, here's the deal, Ryan. I've, I've been – seen my dad go through the hall of fame and I, you know, we do the hall of fame at Viking and you need to enjoy the night, not in a race car, not in the pits, not worrying about things. You know what I mean? It's your night. Um, I don't know if they do a meet and greet beforehand or if they do a meal or whatever they do, but um, this is your night. It's your hometown track. Enjoy the night. Stay out of the race car, kick back. People want to see you. People want to talk to you. Fans want to talk to you. You're, you know what I mean? They're coming to see you. So I don't, I, I, I'd stay out of the race car and I'd, I'd just enjoy your night, Ryan. That's my personal thoughts and personal opinion. Bert? Well, I was going to say, well, of course you need to get into the car, but actually uh, Coach does make a good point. Um, I mean, my grandpa, I mean, he passed away, but he was inducted into the Shano Speedway Hall of Fame earlier this year. And, I mean, unfortunately it rained that night. Coach is right. There's a lot of stuff going on. You know, people want to meet with you. And um, I don't get into a situation where the night is over and you wish you would have spent more time doing other things rather than focusing on racing. So I, I, I'm undecided yet. I'm about 25% of the way there because I literally, a, a whole bunch of the family and pit crews like, oh, yeah, you got to race. You got to race. You got to race. You got to race. We haven't seen you race for a while. You got to race. And I'm like, be honest, I lost this step. I ain't raced in a while. I've got like five nights in in about the last seven years. Now, and then they're like, well, we could park right next to the fenced in area and you don't have to work on it. You can hang out up there. And I, so I don't know. So Youper's obviously, he, he wants me to race and Changa wants me to race and all that. Right. So, Youper's next prediction is based on if I do. He said, if Aho races, both the 29 star and the 71A will finish outside of the top five, but the 71A will have a higher finishing position <laughs> than the 29 star. I don't know if that's that's a pretty tough one because you guys only get about 10 supers and I'll have like 22 freaking mods. So um, if I have a bad night, it could be 20th. If you have a bad night, it could be 10th. So by default, I think that's a pretty tough deal. But I don't know. The jury is still out. Uh, well, tell punch. tell me you can take his bold prediction and shove it because I ain't racing this weekend. So I don't know what the oh, heck. Oh, you're we don't, not. Yeah. We're off. Yeah. Viking's off. Right. I'm not going racing. I got to run the dumbbell derby. So um, maybe he should do his little homework and look at my <laughs> race pass. <laughs> <laughs> and say, oh, Vikings Speedway is not racing this weekend. Maybe I should use my head and a little common sense um, and realize that oh, Coach probably isn't racing this weekend. Well, we'll have to utilize the next time you're out then. All right. So undecided. Punch the buttons below. Should I race? Should I not? Everybody, I don't know. I, I'm undecided on that one. All right. So Beefcake's third and final prediction, World of Outlaw Late Models. He swings for the fences, guys. There's a reason he's in last in everything, right? World of Ola Late Models will have 12 different podium drivers over the four nights. <laughs> All right. All right. 
I guess. I guess that's pretty it's, bold. I mean, it's bold. bold. It can't can't get ten. Can't take that away. I'm gonna go with a big parlay here between these four drivers: Bobby Pierce, Devin Moran, Tyler Peterson, and Cole Searing. All of those drivers will win at least fifty percent of the of the features that they attend. So, for example, if Pierce races four nights, he'll win at least two, right? So they'll win at least 50%. Each of them will win at least 50% of the races that they attend this weekend. All right, guys. So punch the buttons. If you ever got feedback, you got any questions, send them our way. Thanks to all of our great sponsors. Let, let me know if I should enjoy the night and, and visit with everybody up there or if I should turn some laps in uh, Eric Anderson's B mod, um, I don't know, undecided yet on that. Krause is like, enjoy the night. Bert's kind of 50 50 on that. If it, was a, if it was a super stock, Ryan, I, I might change my two, but like a B mod, like, really? Like, come on. I mean, hot Carl <laughs> right now, he's like, well, what are you doing, Ryan? What are you doing to get in a, in a B mod? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, you, you're not a B mod guy. You know what I mean? Like, you're a super stock guy. Fair I, enough. They only might, get like you, they only get like eight super stocks up there. Well, like, perfect. Like then they'll have like nine, it. and you're guaranteed a top ten. So I mean, the top it's 10. like, yeah. uh, uh <laughs> that, that's I'm like, you don't need to get in a B mod. Come on. Yeah, I guess the jury's still out. Let me know what you think. Hit me up. So, again, uh, thanks for tuning in. Episode 236 this past week, and hope you enjoy the show, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please leave a review and subscribe. It is Puka. And Goat Sports has another show out there by podcast, Facebook, and YouTube. It's the Tea with Miss McGill show. Covers hockey, high school hockey in northern Minnesota. So if you're into hockey, you can find us on podcast under T with Miss McGill. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook, Goat Sports Media LLC. Uh, my, uh, yours truly and Coach Reed Larson, we break it down every week. We also do some interesting interviews. We'd love to have you. So tell your friends, tell your enemies, and we'll catch you next week.